It's a drag. It's a Dragon Force music video. Is what you're describing right now. I've never wanted to have sex with a pot pie, but like, I'd have sex with that pot pie. <laughs> We're all weak to stepping on nails. Let me preface this by saying I wrote a script. Daytona Beach is like two mild inconveniences from being a post-apocalyptic wasteland anyway. So many of my tabs say semen. Are you guys ready for this weird horny adventure that we're all about to go on? You can't handcuff me for skanking. This motherfucker gaslights you. Diet Coke and Sorrow will be chapter four. And against all odds, Kyle, we became those squirrely weirdos. This whole podcast is a very negative mouthfeel. Hello and welcome to Debate This, the show where no one is right but someone is definitely wrong. In this show, we take time out of our busy adult lives to talk about comic books, video games, and how I just remember that I didn't put anything here. So, what do you guys want to talk about? Video games are weird, huh? <laughs> just, I love that we've been doing this for three years, and still we, occasionally we catch, we we catch still, ourselves on this one. Yeah. I'm not going back. Um, I've been playing Returnal. That game rules. Have you guys seen that game yet? Um, I've not. Pretend that I have, and then I'm excited yeah. to talk to you. About Todd's it. seen it. Explain part? it to me. I it, just told you my favorite yeah. part. What's your favorite part? Um, it, it's it's the new hot game. It just came out for PS5 at the time of recording. It's been out for like a week. Um, and it's kind of like a cross between Alien and like a bullet hell. Um, okay. It's like a sci-fi horror, um, but it's like it's like a roguelite. And if you like roguelites, it's kind of like Hades, but it's like a lot harder than Hades. It's really fun. I've I've been enjoying Is it. it. It's uh, top it's down. Rad. Um, it's third person shooter. Okay. Yeah. It's a third person shooter bullet hell, which is very weird. Oh. Um, cool. but I love bullet hells. It's like my weirdly enough, like one of my favorite genres. I love Enter the Gungeon, as I've said on this show many times. So I don't know. It just like kind of clicked with me. Anyway, I've been playing that. Um, I've been playing Pokemon Snap. That's fun. Oh Wholesome, yeah. Is that delightful? Is that yeah? Is that what it needed to be? It it sure is. It's another forty dollars Switch game that I that was sixty dollars, but other than that, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> there are a few of those. Yeah, my, Todd, any, my, Todd, any good ones? Nope my my workload in real life work has been bad, so I've had no. <laughs> Got it. Cool. Well, we're going to talk about a different game today. Oh, and um, Invincible is good. I'm, oh I'm, yeah, I have watched a lot. I'm of one episode from Invincible finishing Invincible now. Um, the X-ray feature on Amazon Prime scratches my itch of having imdb open all the time anyway so it's <laughs> yeah that's super cool that is integrated that well well lovely audience for the past year we've been bringing you a brand new flavor text each month commissioned by one of our very own members of hashtag butt Plomb nation check out patreon.com slash debate this cast for more information on that now normally today would have been a traditional dt episode but due to some personal things matt wasn't able to join today so we're calling an audible and I've decided to commission my own flavor text. <laughs> this is my nightmare. He he paid fifty dollars <laughs> of his own money, yeah, to make yep. us sit through um, what we're about to endure. Today. This is why people have podcasts, right? Uh, so I make the rules here, and because I make the rules <laughs> today, we're talking about a franchise that I can't seem to get out of my head lately, which is Near. Now. I'm not going to bother asking what your guys' familiarity is with Near because I know the answer to that. It's absolutely nothing. Um, now, listeners, you may recall me referring to Near Replicant in last week's episode and how it was a game that, quote, and I'll quote myself, should have been an email. Uh, well, today I'm going to walk you through that email. <laughs> that will be <laughs> you're a gonna, very long email. You're going to sit in on that meeting. Yeah. That, yeah. that could have just been an email. Exactly. Uh, three playthroughs later, I still stand by that and will firmly say that it is my absolute favorite game ever that I also hated playing. You, you're such a insane person when it comes to torturing yourself through video games and i don't I thank know you for it what mm. story game i've played through three complete times yeah andrew does <laughs> I don't, andrew could tell you the story games he's played through three times and i bet there's more than one of them i'm gonna leave every second of that dead air in andrew what's uh, with the weird capitalization in the name of this franchise yep yeah, yeah it's 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 written as uh, capital N I E capital R. And there it is. Um, okay. You didn't answer his question. You just I I have so much more understanding right. of that now. Thank you. Um, now let me let me be very very clear. The story, the characters, the music, and the lore behind original Nier are all objectively very good. They are very weird but wonderful and and 
stupidly complicated but still lovable all the same. It's just that it is an absolute bummer to play. <laughs> and that's that's the real like unfortunate thing. Now, I, you've also, listeners who have been uh, around for a long time, well, no, I've talked a lot about Nier Automata, which I would argue is a perfect game and fixed all of those problems and is just an absolute dream to play. And anyone out there, like if you even have want to like dip your toe into jrpgs please go play your near autonomy it is it's so very good um regardless two flavor texts in one month is a lot for the average human being to handle so to help carry the load of the extra lore weight i fabricated synthetic replicants derived from the dna of human co-hosts formerly known as kyle grimoire vice harper and todd grimoire noir thomas you guys is this game detroit become human but less fun it's different fun. Oh, wait, that's <laughs> that's a yes. That's, that's that's parent for for it is bad fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if Bomberman was also Detroit Become Human, then maybe this can be too. I, I'm I'm just waiting to find out. Like, is this not fun? Like, watching Schindler's List is not fun, or is this not fun? Like, um, menuing through nine levels of menu hell is not fun. Um, this is very fun. I, I, this is like it's like stupid fun it's definitely not like i know what you're saying it's not like how like grave of the fireflies is a really good movie you're gonna like hate okay. yourself after you watch okay. it it's not like that like this is very silly stupid fun um it wants to be the combat wants to be better than it is and and it is i think the the game is its biggest fault is it came out in 2010 when we'll, we'll get into it we'll get into it but like i said near automata is is the better iteration of a lot of things but there's still a lot to like here um let me let me dive in i want to start by talking a little bit about the creator of near yoko taro wait are you gonna ask us how much we know about this game no, he said he was gonna skip that because we don't oh, know okay anything. Yeah. <laughs> well do you want to answer that you know nothing i know nothing i wanted um, to just take a moment to say i know nothing does the name yoko taro mean anything to either of you nope i don't know that it would i'm just curious no so, as we often do with Flavor Text, uh, we like to start by talking a little bit about the creative engine behind what we talk about. In this case, it's Yoko Taro. Yoko Taro is what you would call an artiste uh, <laughs> among the gaming world, similar to Hideo Kojima. He's got a very specific style, he's got a unique personality, and that just like seeps through every inch of his work. Um, his whole brand is this like very cynical, almost trolly, dark sense of humor kind of like a less masculine Zack Snyder. He's the, the Zack Snyder of anime, if you will. Oh, a lot, of, a lot of slowed down close-ups. Yeah, well, yeah, not not so much for the action stuff, but just like the, uh, we have, we've done this to preserve Zack Snyder's uh, vision. creative vision or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing, you know. Again, as we do with every flavor text, there is an imager library um, for you listening at home. Be sure to access the show notes. You click that link. Go on and you can follow along on the image library if you're uh, by a computer or a phone. So image one showcases Yoko Taro. Um, he is oh. notorious for uh, showing up and doing press events and interviews wearing this signature helmet <laughs> that he wears. Great. It's so <laughs> dumb. I love it. It's, uh, if you can't see the image, it's got, it's kind of like this, like, it looks like a big, like a, like almost like the moon from Majora's Mask. It's it's like if the moon from Majora's Mask and Jack Skellington and Dead yeah. Mouse were crammed into one thing. That is perfect. Yeah. If, yeah. if Tim yeah, if Tim Burton did Dead Mouse's costume design, yep. I think that's yep. where we're at. That was both of you perfectly executed. Well done. <laughs> well, I mean, it really pulled something out from within yeah. me yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, sure look did. at this. So I wanted to really <laughs> articulate it. <laughs> Um, and Square Enix knows this and totally leans into his personality. Square Enix publishes a lot of a lot of his games. Um, they actually produced a 30 minute interview about one of his games, Dragon Guard Three, uh, where he responded to every question as a sock puppet, which is shown in Image Two. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. That's, yeah. That's so fine. He, so he's completely and fully hinged and grounded in yep. reality. Okay. Yeah. Definitely not insane. Definitely not a big old pervert. Okay. Good. Cool. Good. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about Yoko Taro. He began his career as a CGI designer in the late 90s and ended up working for a studio named Kavia, um, where he was part of a team developing a new IP called Drakengard. Um, and he would go on to co-write the script and create a lot of the characters and scenarios. 
Drakengard is really pretty forgettable. It's your typical like medieval fan- fantasy. You're a knight with a dragon, yada yada yada. Uh, it's like a dark fantasy which came out before like The Witcher and all those things. So it was you know unique for its time. Um, the game was produced by Square Enix, like I said. Uh, it was released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2. It was received fairly well in Japan, but didn't do great globally. And the general consensus is that this game has some interesting narrative themes, but is complete and total ass to play. <laughs> Good. Which again, like you're gonna here's a follow here's a here's a through line. Um, this this really show this was kind of the first iteration of Yoko Taro's you know, cynical approach and taste for the controversial. Um, he he wanted to separate Dragon Guard from other traditional medieval fantasy things like Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, and some of the Western RPGs, um, and drew inspiration from this idea that RPG protagonists, by definition kill thousands of, of people in their quest for g- good or to save the world. And by definition, cannot be true heroes. It's kind of like the old D&D adage, like you're just a bunch of murder hobos. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so he kind of like dug in on that and was like, well, all my protagonists should be incredibly flawed. So Drakengard's characters reflect that ideal to like the 10th power. Um, and they represent all these things. Like the main character is incestual with his sister and there's a cannibal and there's a, a repressed pedophile who's yeah there's do, dealing with some stuff there's some weirdos in, in dragon guard again dragon guard not a great game so um, so the, <laughs> it was it was gritty gritty reboot before gritty mm-hmm. reboots took off it's yeah yeah i mean exactly this is 2003 so this was like before max Payne, like before all the real uh, edgy shit started it around that time when it was time, like starting to make time. a point yeah, yeah that begins like, i guess hmm. was also 2003 and that's what i yeah, good point consider yep. the kickoff of the gritty reboot so yeah cool yeah fun um, awesome this is fun cannibalism <laughs> cool uh yes and taro uh taro was unsatisfied with all the changes that the producer had requested for jack and guard the last second um and therefore kind of like dipped out also caviar was acquired by another company so they were they had dissolved so um jack and guard went out to have a sequel a couple years later named jack and guard 2 he wasn't really involved in that um years later Yoko Taro came back to work on a new project that would eventually be known as Nier. Um, Taro was, so kind of how he was inspired by the whole murder hobo thing in the, in the first version, and the first example, this time he was inspired by the surge of nationalism following the September 11th attacks and wanted hmm. to create a game that explored the idea of justifying mass murder. Now, this is something that's not necessarily a new thing um there is another game called spec ops the line that does this really well as also um justifying you know like the idea that two sides of a war can both be right Hmm. based on their own perspective okay yeah um but that was kind of the thread the through line that he was going going for um and that was so that was kind of the impetus behind near um and we'll get into that uh, Nier was released in Japan in April of 2010 and was actually released under two different names. Nier colon Replicant for the PS3 and Nier colon Gestalt for the Xbox 360. Why? <laughs> Great question. Uh, is the answer localization? The answer, the common answer is marketing. I don't, I don't know that we exactly know. Um, I've listened to a couple interviews about it. I think the most common answer is marketing. Um, because at the time, again, as Kyle mentioned, this was the, now 2010 was the height of gritty reboot and everything is mm-hmm. orange and gray and, and whatever. And the main difference between the two games is near replicant stars, a very tropey anime teen, 18 boy and near Gestalt rather stars a gritty ma- old man. The other, there's no oh. other difference between the two games other than the main protagonist, and they're they have the same name and they say the same things. It's just like it's just aesthetic. Okay. Um, and the the common theory is that there was a, a marketing decision that they thought that the the old man would sell better, um, and and therefore the Western version, the global version, actually got distilled down to just the near Gestalt version. So near Replicant was never released outside of Japan. Oh, so the okay. rest of the world okay. got near Gestalt that was just called near. I see. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So in 2010, l- later that summer, 
Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 both got near, uh, which of course was which featured the dad character, which we'll talk about. Now, for a long time, Nier was considered to be a cult classic. Again, similar to Drakengard, not received incredibly well. Um, there's a famous uh, video, Justin McElroy, actually, uh, like one of his first like big videos that went viral was he was still at Joystick. He was reviewing Nier, and uh, you can see it's still on YouTube. This is like a million views. He was, it's just eight minutes of him yelling about Nier's fishing mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like before Justin McElroy was like really before, popular. Before he like, was Justin McElroy. Yeah. Before he was Justin McElroy. Cause that was, yeah, he would have been a year into like joystick or something mm-hmm. like that. So a little fun fact there. Um, the game's story and characters still at that time were beloved. And, and I, you know, that the soundtrack to Nier and, and I will, listeners, I will intercut some of the near songs into this episode because I think it's important to hear the music. It is that good. I think near soundtrack is still considered to be like one of the greatest game soundtracks of all time, but it just everything else about the game really dragged it down. The grindy quests, the bland combat, just like just a lot, a lot to love and a lot to hate. I think actually now that you mention it, that is where I probably first heard of near was on some list of like best video game music or soundtracks so totally that, possible that i've absolutely. definitely heard of the title but i know literally yeah. nothing yeah nothing yeah. else except maybe Got it. that yeah that's that's totally fair um so a few years later yoko taro directed dragon guard 3 and then in 2017 collaborated with platinum games to create the aforementioned near automata which is a follow-up to near it is a semi-sequel. We'll talk about that later. Um, Automata, Automata is a completely self-contained story, and I played Automata first, and I didn't have a problem. It references near. It's kind of like Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. They reference each other, but they're not direct sequels. Um, was that reference just for me? I think that reference was just I, for me. I got it. I got what you were saying, but it was still just for you. They At will. least three times a year, you suggest I should play Chrono Trigger, and I don't. You should fucking play Chrono Trigger. Because I know I would love I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to kill you through. I'm going to murder you through this. <laughs> Slack call if you don't do it eventually. Someone someone give us fifty bucks so Todd has to play Chrono Trigger live on recording and we can like, finally put this to rest. Back back, I mean, my favorite probably game is still Super Mario RPG. And like they're always put in the same category. I just yeah. haven't done it. Yeah. And I won't. Well like then now I'll, you won't have a principle. Like I'll never play Overwatch. We wore you down on Overwatch, Todd. <laughs> it's like I'll never watch the Mandalorian. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, so yeah, near Automata, uh, Automata, great game. Um, like I said, it took all of the bad out of near and replaced it with good. So basically you've got all the story and the characters and the environments from near, but with like, it's Bayonetta. So it's great. It's a oh, great game. Okay. Earlier in, earlier in this year, in 2021, uh, Square Enix course released a remake of the original near t- titled near replicant version 1.22474487139. <laughs> Why? Is that number relevant in some yes. way? I'm sure it is. Um, which would finally make the replicant version of the game available to a global audience. So, near replicant, at least for the PS4, and PS5, and PC, I think, uh, features the brother protagonist uh, instead of the grizzled dad protagonist. Um, they also made major tweaks to the game's combat. Uh, and graphics, obviously, and then um, added a new secret ending uh, oh. that you can beat, that you can find after three playthroughs, which is why I played through the game three times, like an insane person. Um, through, also, this is... Through my thorough, thorough Googling, um, that number is just the square root of one and a half, and oh. doesn't seem to mean anything else. All right, well, I'll take that. I assumed that was just a troll, but yeah. that's, that's cool. Um this one's also for Daddy, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yoko Taro also collaborated with scenario writers of Final Fantasy XIV um, to write a completely new raid series based on the Nier franchise, um, which is a big deal in that world. Just take my word for it. Whoa, that's incredible. I can't believe they did <laughs> Thanks, that Kyle. collaboration. You're a good friend, Kyle. I try. <laughs> you specifically. Yeah, I, w- I noticed how yeah. I didn't say anything here. Yeah. Um, I'm all right. Before we get into Nier's story, we do should touch on one key point from Drakengard. Now, this is, again, this is very akin to the, the Tarantino-verse, where it's like, all the movies are connected! Ah! Sure. Yeah. So, um, ending E... <laughs> that I hate... Stop. Okay. 
the fact Todd's done. that it's yeah labeled ending e i already hate this continue ending e of the original dragon guard was originally just meant to be a joke but ultimately years later served as an in foundation for an entire franchise that would eventually is. go on to win game of the year awards oh i hate love that <laughs> God. so it's it's like we got Kingdom Hearts in our Five Nights of Freddy's is what is actually what this is. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're really not wrong. Oh God. Um, but it was like if Kingdom Hearts was created and with somebody like at a bar, be like, oh fuck it, Mickey Mouse and Cloud, whatever. <laughs> be like that. That's that's what um, it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not it's not not what it is. Uh, so yada yada yada. The protagonist's name is Kaim. Came Kaim makes a pact with a dragon whose name is Angelus. They embark on a quest to stop a death cult from ending the known universe, and they do that. One of the endings, it doesn't. It literally doesn't matter. One of the endings sees Came and Angelus chasing the god of the cultist, also known as the Queen Beast, <laughs> into a time vortex that dumps the three of them out into modern day Tokyo. So image three is of the massive queen beast, which I will oh, okay. heretoforth be referring to as the salt lady. Oh, okay. Uh, it, um, the salt yeah. lady is a kaiju. The salt lady is absolutely yep. a kaiju. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's this like extra final battle, which is basically just a rhythm game. So <laughs> you, you ride a dragon and play Guitar Hero against a giant salt yeah. lady attacking Tokyo. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it's a it. Dra- it's a Dragon Force music video. <laughs> is what you're describing <laughs> right now. It sure is. Oh, it's so stupid. Um, so this so is the ending to Dragon Guard. Ending, ending e, e of Dragon Guard. <laughs> yep. And is the basis for the entire Near franchise. Is what you you're telling it. me. Is this? That's is what I'm this, telling you. Um, Dragon Force music video <laughs> come to life. Okay. So, I just had to so, make sure I got everything in place. Continue. Yeah, no, you're good. So, so Kaim and Angelus successfully take down the Queen Beast, but then shot down by the Japanese military because Ugh. it's a fucking dragon in the middle of Tokyo. Um, and happens. the dragon is like impaled on a tower. Oh. Right. Um, meanwhile, the Queen Beast is, explodes and dissolves into thousands of tiny little salty particles. All right, fast forward. Let's talk about so wait, that. Wait. So that was the throwaway ending that they were like, no, 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 that one's the canon ending now. Yep. What was the canon ending? Well, it's, that it's got- like multiple. It's like multiple universes. Like, like there is a there is a different universe where the Draken Guard happens and Draken Guards do okay. the guard and they Draken. So it's and like then this it, universe is this. It, it's it's the it's the Legend of Zelda timelines thing that has been thoroughly valued by the community and not ever argued against. Yep, completely. Yes, taken at at face value mm-hmm. unilaterally. Yes. Good. All right. So near, we open in a snowy post-apocalyptic Tokyo in the year 2053. We see an emaciated teenage boy, or a pale grizzled old man, depending on the version. <laughs> Is, is sitting in an abandoned convenience store with his younger sister slash daughter who is just coughing up a storm. This is Nier and his young sister slash daughter, Yona. So standard JRPG opening. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you've got image four is Father Nier. Who you can see is like his face is all sunken in. He looks, his hair is like all stringy. He looks like shit. Um... Image five is Brother Near, which this is the PS3 version, so the PS4 version makes him look a lot ghouly- ghoulisher. Um, and then image five is Yona. Okay. That's his little sister. Cool. Sorry, that's four, five, some, and six, respectively. Some JRPG protagonist looking characters. Mm-hmm. You got it. Um, we see lying next to Yona and Near uh, is this black book with some elaborate detailing on the cover. And Nier looks at Yona and says, never touch that book, no matter what. Oh, guess what Yona's going to do in about <laughs> five minutes. touch that book. <laughs> God. Okay, um, real time out. <laughs> I, tropes like that are so stupid, but also, like, the more I become an adult, I appreciate them more. Yeah. Because, like, I have this discussion, like, 
if my wife and I are watching something, I'll be like, ooh, she's going to touch that book. And like, I never yeah. get tired of saying that. No, nope. I never get tired of them being proven right by that series slash game. It's because you get to feel like a really smart person when you're proven right. <laughs> yep. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. Near Autonomous makes me feel like a really smart yeah. person. Yeah. Um, liking Okotaro makes you feel like a really smart person because it's the Rick and Morty of, <laughs> of anime. Uh, you're interesting if you like this. I get it. Yeah. 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 This is a, liking Nier as a personality. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. Um, and I like Nier. Um, <laughs> now, at this point, the pair are attacked by this gang, a gang of these creepy shadow creatures, and Nier is quickly overwhelmed. Um, I should note, too, that the pra- protagonist is just protagonist. Like, you can name him whatever. It's like Link. His canon name is Nier. So just sure. put that out there. And, of course, in the last ditch effort, Nier grabs the book and is like, help me. And then a flash and Nier suddenly explodes in this, like, red magic. And all of a sudden, now we have our prologue fight, complete with shooting magic missiles and magic punches from a floating book. So this showcases Nier's main combat, which is third-person action-adventure. You have a sword, and you have this little book that floats by. It literally floats on your shoulder. And with the shoulder buttons on the controller, you can use different spells and abilities. So like the standard vanilla book spell is literally like a little magic missile, just like little pew-pew bullets. Um, but as the book levels up, you can get other things like these like spears. Um, the book can do like a melee punch. You can do like area of effect, you know, your standard like magic attack shit. Yeah. Your normal Final Fantasy esque yeah. attacks, mm-hmm. but it's yeah. a book. It's a magic book. Yep. It's a magic book. So Nier fights off the shadow creatures with the magic book and runs back to Yona, who is now curled up in pain. She's like coughing. Her face starts flashing with all these black runes as she admits to Nier she, wait for it, oh. touched the book. Oh, touched Yona. Book. She's like, I tried to help. You poor sweet girl. Yeah. Um, the the two of them are just like sitting in this abandoned this ruined convenience store and the camera pans away and we see just this completely decimated city uh we hear near screaming we need help uh and we fade to black title card 1412 years later all right okay so this is what (laughs) year 3057 55 uh it's like 3468 perfect love it yeah doesn't matter um so we open (laughs) in a small (laughs) idyllic village because it's a jrpg uh, we see two characters that look a hell of a lot like near and yona who are also called near and yona um, living together in a small house. Oh, that's weird. Um, yeah, Yona has a violent cough, and Nier is doing whatever he can to make ends meet to find a cure. Um, image seven shows us Nier, uh, brother Nier, and his sister Yona. Image eight shows us father Nier and his Nier and his daughter. Okay, I like the art on the father better than brother. Really? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, think that dad looks like ass, but that's interesting. <laughs> he's got I mean, maybe it's just all the Monster Hunter I've been playing lately. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> that's fair. I get I'm halfway between Monster Hunter and the Witcher vibes on the dad. Yeah, um, he's voiced by Sojiro Sakura, who uh, uh, in Persona 5, I, he's voiced by the character, the guy who did Sojiro from Persona 5, the dad character in Persona 5. Yeah, um, oh, OK, so he's just got a very like dad voice. You know. <laughs> um this is like very he's a good that guy's a good voice actor he's done a bunch of other things but um yeah i don't i don't i think dad near sunken in eyes are really creepy yeah those aren't good yeah i mean it, it this also kind of looks like two images from two different generations of consoles so i don't know if that's mm. like the they best, are yeah yeah best comparison the, the, that's the thing all the all the pictures of brother near from the remake so okay. they just look a lot better yeah now i can't not look at the soulless eyes of the dad <laughs> and i don't like it yeah um so just note for every time i talk about near from here on i'm going to only refer to the brother since that's the version that i played but again brother dad doesn't really affect the story in any way it's just aesthetically oh brother dad Brother, my, fa- my favorite is brother dad. <laughs> um, so Nier's whole thing is that he's doing odd jobs for this woman named Popola, who operates out of the giant library at the top of the hill, overseeing the rest of the village. Uh, Popola, she's kind of like the de facto mayor, the town elder, even though she's very young. Um, her twin sister, Devila, is like the town bard and just like hangs out in the tavern. So the two of them, they're like the lifeblood of this town. 
uh, they're shown in image nine. And a lot of these are official illustrations from the game. Okay. So it's not just, they're not all screen caps from the game. Um, that's Devil and Popola. They're twins. Which one has hmm. the, the wilder hair? Uh, I believe that's Devla. Yeah. Okay. So, and Devla and Popola are your primary quest givers. Popola is like all your main quests, and Devla has a lot of side quests. So, throughout the game, you talk to them a lot. They're pretty integral. So, I want to talk a little bit again, music is a big part of this game. And the soundtrack, like I said, the soundtrack's really great. It, the game does a lot of really good storytelling using the soundtrack. Um, it uses uh, different characters' themes really interestingly. Um, one of the more, the t- more known themes is the song called Song of the Ancients, which is, which is Popola and Devil's signature songs. So, the, so this is actually, this has a narrative um, perspective as well. So you're introduced to the song first as this like old poem. Um, so Popola mentions it and she says, oh yeah, the uh, Devil uh, like discovered this old folk poem or whatever and, and sings it. And actually in the game, whenever you encounter Devil, whenever you walk up to her, you hear her singing. And the the theme song for the village, when you're in the village, because that's the only place you see Popola and Devil, is the is the like backing track to Song of the Ancients without the vocal, with the instrumental. So whenever you walk up to Devil, the instrumental kicks in. And only when you're in proximity to Devil. Okay. Later on in the game, there is a Popola version, and you can actually get both of them to, like in a side quest, you can get both of them to sing together. And you and the game will overlay the Popola and Devil version and That's turn it cool. into a duet. It's really cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So listeners at home, the entire soundtrack is on Spotify. Um, if you're listening on Spotify, great. I've got links in here. If not, check it out on Spotify. Um, Hashtag sponsored ad. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think they have to right. give us money or something for it to yeah. be a sponsored ad. Uh, it's just called Song of the Ancients, and there's a couple different variations of it. And we'll, we'll see another one later on. Um, anyway, uh, oh, and a fun fact about this one. So um, the language, when you, when you listen to the song, the language that they are singing is actually a made-up language, entirely made up by the singer, Emmy Evans. <laughs> So I, she just like made up a language for this song. I so I pulled this up and and listened to both of them briefly while you talked mm-hmm. about these. And had you not said it was a made up language, I would have assumed it was Japanese because mm-hmm. I don't know Japanese well enough to know that it's not. So there. what you're saying is a made up language, but it doesn't hit the threshold of Simlish. It doesn't hit the threshold of Simlish. No, it sounds very Welsh. Um, a lot yeah. of her songs were. She kind of she's some of the other songs in this in this soundtrack. She uh, meshed together Welsh, German, French, and some other Norwegian um, languages. But this one is actually completely made up. So. Nice, neat. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Um, anyway, so Nier's kind of like whole role in the in the village is to help to protect them from the shades. These are these violent monsters that run rampant around the world, mindlessly attacking people. It's the same creatures that attacked. Uh, our protagonist in the prologue as well. And that's, we've got an image of a shade in image 10. Andrew. What? These are, these are, these are heartless. <laughs> yeah. That's just a heartless. They're Andrew. heartless. This is, yeah. This is just it's heartless. This is, these are just heartless from Kingdom yeah. Hearts. They're heartless from Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> You're doing Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew, I feel like you just tricked us into doing Kingdom Hearts again. So Nier tells his sister the story <laughs> of the lunar tear. <laughs> A mystical flower that's said to grant any wish, wish to the person lucky enough to find one. So, of course, Yona sets out to find one to wish for a cure while Nier is out, out hunting the shades. Uh, Nier comes back, finds his sister is gone. He has to go find his sister who's headed to the Lost Shrine, one whole tutorial's way away from the village. <laughs> uh, he, he climbs his way up the temple, fighting along the way. At the top of the mountain, he finds his sister being guarded by two statues and this magical force field with a floating book in the center. We've seen a book before. Oh. Um, hmm. Nier, uh, Nier tries to fight off the statues, but not making any progress. Um, as he's doing so, the book starts yelling at him, saying, Free me! Free me! I am Grimoire Vice! Um, just like in the prologue, Nier makes his pact with this sentient floating book and can now shoot magic missiles. And said book is shown on image 11. This is Grimoire Vice. This is our, our second main oh, character. Okay. Oh, good. He's nice. a surly. He's a surly British book. The surly book. He's got like yep. weird 
I shouldn't say weird, but like he's got like the fish fish mutton chops. And yeah, it so this book is frowning. The book is frowning. But it looks like you could just completely flip its mouth upside down and it would be a a good looking smile. Yeah. Well it has no <laughs> nose. That's also what's striking out to me. Does it, does it talk out of this face on the book or does it just kinda is it a disembodied it, voice most of the time? Okay, so <laughs> It doesn't move its mouth, Good. but one of my favorite things about it is when it's talking in the animation, the book shakes. Yeah, <laughs> like Good. like you know, like when you're when you're a kid and you're playing with stuffed animals and you just like you move the the move the mm-hmm. the little stuffed animals mm-hmm. like they're puppets. The book shakes when he talks. What was <laughs> the so easiest stupid. way for the for the team to animate the book and be like the book is talking? <laughs> Oh, but we're not yes. gonna go all in on making the mouth move. No, Don't, no. it's no. so it's so delightfully stupid. And the book, and I, Grimoire Vice is like one of people's favorite parts of of this of this story because uh, he's got like a very like pompous British voice, um, and he talks. I am Grimoire Vice, and I am the most powerful being on the planet. <laughs> I am a being of incalculable importance, and yet you approach me as a common cockroach. He comments on all of the things that Nier does, and Nier, at least the brother character, is all very like, "Ah, oh, shucks. He's like, <laughs> lad, why do you do all of these things for these ho- these hovel peasants? And he's like, we gotta do it to save the world. Ah, shucksy ghouls. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the... The dynamic between them two is very funny so the, and, and the, does not get old. So Nier is is Goku, and yeah, and this is our our master Roshi character, I guess. But he's a gruff British officer uh, from the nineteen thirties. Yeah, yeah, he's he's kind of like he's I would say less of a master Roshi and more of a like I don't know like a he's like your fish out of water. Like, why are you doing okay. these things? Okay, okay, like that kind of. Thing. I see. Um. So after rescuing no- Yona, uh, Nier reveals to Grimoire Vice that, uh, and us ex- by extension, that Yona has this deadly disease known as the Black Scrawl. Um, what it does, it creates these black magical runes on people and slowly kills them. Sounds terrible. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's real bad. Um, to date, uh, no one has survived it and there is no known cure. It is like slowly wiping out this, this civilization. Well, that seems um, like a real bummer. I hope, there's a, I hope there's a cure that we can find through plot. <laughs> Yeah, well, there might be, Todd. <laughs> there might be, Todd. Uh, Popola tells Nier back at the village that there is a prophecy about a fabled white book and a black book. It just so happens that we found a white book. The, uh, the black book is responsible for death and disease, but can be destroyed by the aforementioned white uh, book. Now, yeah. you may remember, we have seen a black book before in the prologue. It was the one that we weren't supposed to touch. Yes. Bingo. But, but it was touched. It was super touched. Um, Grimoire Vice reveals to Nier that he, wait for it, has amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course he does. Yep, and therefore cannot remember all of his great powers. But mm. if Nier can help him find the sealed verses, which are the source of Grimoire Vice's powers, Vice can, in return, help Nier cure Yona's Black Scrawl. So the two set off to find the rest of the sealed verses. Our inciting action. Hooray! Mm-hmm. I Quite feel like a hero's journey. We've got bubble in here. I feel like we need to do a sidebar just on every video game that uses massive amnesia as a plot oh device. My God. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just it's the easiest storytelling mm-hmm. right uh, approach or function. Um, so Popola suggests that Nier seek out the sh- junk shop outside of town as a way to strengthen his weapon, and and so we do that. We meet we meet the two brothers Gideon and Jacob. They're just brother ass brothers. There's nothing remarkable about them. Um, they agree to improve Nier's weapon if Nier can go find the required materials in the nearby abandoned factory. Therefore, has us going into dungeon number two, and we trash these mindless automatons to grind metals and other materials. Come back, brothers ask Nier to find their help them find their mom, who had left a week ago to forge for materials even deeper inside the factory. So Nier and Vice go back into the factory, into the lower levels, and m- fight a uh, mechanical head in hands. <laughs> of course. Bingo card, if you got your bingo mm-hmm, card yep. up. Um, and, and all they find is the corpse of the boy's mom next to the corpse of another man. Seems the mom, I guess, had decided to abandon the boys to run off with her lover. Ah. Uh, which is 
pretty dark but it's a bummer you yeah know, that's a, a big bummer mm-hmm. now you as the player can actually choose to tell the boys the truth or not um i did and uh the outcome was that the older brother the older brother is like okay i kind of figured that was the case i just i just i'm glad she was happy in the end like well she got oh. murdered by a giant robot so she probably wasn't that happy but no, sure I- um Either way, mission to complete. We're on to find the next sealed verse. Um, Get that experience. Question, we're leaving. Question before we move on from the head and hands. Do the hands yeah. have a giant gem in the center? That is. Do the, the hands point? have a giant gem in the center? <laughs> oh, of course. Come on, Kyle. What kind of question is that? <laughs> I just needed to know. How else are you going to know the weak point? I just needed to know if I if I could check that box of my off my JRPG bingo card. Oh my um, god! A game you only yeah. win if you check every box on the card. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Um, well, speaking of bingo card entries, next we mean we meet Kaine in a closed off village that's called the Airy. Now, Kaine is our girl character, Uh-oh. and, uh, yes, and as a like result that of that, <laughs> <laughs> as a result, she's dressed in what's basically lingerie, um, but also wields two giant serrated blades, like un like uncharged chainsaws. Yep. <laughs> and That's also what? her what left arm and left leg are all wrapped up in bandages uh, you character. can see her in image 12 <laughs> yep. who, that's I mean, what it is it's, i'm gonna ask this question kind of knowing the answer who is this for <laughs> uh, I, I get it yeah it was 2010 uh, and and yeah. the xbox and like, 360 and ps3 were out like who and you it's think not even just for. lingerie it's like it's like extra revealing lingerie that has yeah i'm not you know what listeners if you look up the image it, you'll know what we're talking it has about like, i don't have anything else it has at. like under boob windows like it's <laughs> yeah. it's real you, bad you know it's real you know how, you always nine times out of ten when you're seeing kine kine you will see her butt like you it is almost guaranteed that you will see her butt yeah so now the like leggings the design is there like vents where the leggings are still there, but it's like a vent in the leggings where like some leg is exposed sporadically. <laughs> it's stupid. Mm-hmm. Her entire outfit is those leggings with yeah. like exposed vents because apparently you need that in launch. I'm I'm done with this character. Well, Todd, this is the most this is the most optimum armor set you can <laughs> you can wear if you're a woman in a video now- game. There. I do want to defend Kaine. Kaine look is like actually they're, they're fight ready as well. Yeah, she she's wearing stripper heels. Despite Kaine's appearance, Kaine is awesome. She's a really sure. cool character. Um, she cusses like a sailor. Also, that's like her pers- her personality is she's she's hardcore. Mm-hmm. Um, no, she's she's one of the guys. She's the girl who's one yeah. of the guys. Does she fix cars too in, in her spare time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a good introduction to her character is actually the first thirty seconds of the game, which is just the intro video. It's just a fi- it's just a black screen. Um, I've linked it here in, in our notes, and I'll I'll link it um, in the show notes as well. If you guys go ahead, go ahead and just click that real quick. I'll wait. Vice, you dumbass! Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry. Maybe I'll rip your pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace. How can someone with such a big, smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord. Come over here and give Vice a big, sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord. Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! Did she call hey. the book a little bitch? <laughs> she called the book a little bitch. <laughs> this, this game really wanted to be rated M, too, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> sure did, Kyle. <laughs> um that's kind of she's she's fun so one of the things that you know people really like about this game and the way that this game rewards you is with banter now that sounds really lame because it is <laughs> but, but the banter is very good and and you've got now like near who's like you're ah oh, shucksy googles and then and grimoire vice who's very this like prim and proper like oh, i'm the most powerful being and then you've got kind of who's like fucking cram it book and she like the <laughs> the voice actor actress is really good um uh laura bailey laura bailey is the voice actress who um is in a lot of the critical role stuff like she's she's pretty uh prominent um laura bailey is very good and does an excellent job and she has this like inflection whenever she's referring to grimoire vice like the way that she says shut up book <laughs> it's like it's very good oh she was um she was kid trunks back to tie this all oh, back okay. to dragon ball z again ah, perfect there you go anyway so uh so 
Nier and Vice help Kaine take down um, this massive shade who looks like a scorpion with eight boobs on its chest. Mm. Um, the boob scorpion, as shown in image 13, uh, tries to hypnotize Kaine by making her think it's her dead grandmother, but Kaine resists, and together Nier and Kaine then destroy the massive shade because that's what you do when you're a boob scorpion. Try to make people think you're your grandmother. Fair. Yeah, I've, I have heard that before. Um, Kaine gets critically wounded and nearly dies, but is pulled back from scary anime death dream world by Nier. Um, we notice that Kaine keeps calling herself a freak and has this like low key di- desire to die, but we say, fuck it and look God in the death in the face and say, not today and get another sealed verse. Um, through that little cutscene series, we do learn that Kaine is actually half shade. Um, uh. but Mm-hmm. And that's why the left side of her body is covered in those uh, in bandages. Uh, but we see those like runes come out, and uh, so she's basically like she is turning into a shade or is infected by sh- with shade. We don't quite know, but she's half shade. Um, um, I just really took really yeah. took a look at this. <laughs> she's throwing uh, shade. This the scorpion boob monster photo. That stance yeah. is meant solely to show off Kaine's ass. Yep. That is all that is. You are not wrong. Todd, you don't you don't design a lingerie sword warrior without <laughs> without putting her in situations that show off the the nudity. Yeah, the nudity. Long. I would say uh, see also Fran from Final Fantasy XII. She is I, that, but with bunny ears also. I was gonna say lingerie sword warrior sounds like something empowering of women in 2021. I feel like this is not that. It's the opposite of that. that. Lingerie sword warrior has the same energy as bitch hunter from yeah. 30 Rock. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is all very um pre pre gamergate too. Yep. To put mm. yeah yeah it, it super is. Um. Anyway, that happens. So Kaine is part of the party. Na, 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 na. Um. Kaine, Nier, and Grimoire Vice then head into the desert, because there's always a desert, uh, <laughs> to the town of Facade, which is a town populated by all these people who wear masks all over their face and speak this very strange language that is actually just garbled Japanese. Like, they took sound bites of Japanese, they recorded it in Japanese, and then scrambled the dialogue. It so up. it kind of... Yeah, so I imagine it sounds like Animal Crossing dialogue sounds to us when we hear it in English. Gotcha. Anyway, that's image 14. Those are, that's the people of Facade. All right. Yep. That's um, the sand people, people trope. Masks. Yep. <laughs> um, so uh, a young girl named Fira uh, offers to guide the party around the town until they end up at the king's quarters, uh, where we find out the young king of Facade is missing, and we have to go find him in an ancient tomb or whatever. Uh, so Nier, Kaine, and Vice travel to dungeon number three, to solve a bunch of block pushing puzzles and fight a cube boss to save the king of facade. One more sealed verse down. Check. Nice. I the... I get that they <laughs> they wanted to tell they wanted to tell a story and then they just put yeah. gameplay in between it. Exactly. This did not need to be a game. Yeah. Yeah, like that's that's what I I think this, this could is, have been a series. This could have just been, been like better. Advent Children. Yeah. We could have yeah. watched this. Exactly. I feel the same way about this that I feel about the Dot Hack series, which we have not talked about on the show, and we're not going to talk about on the show. Oh, you say um, that. Well, now you've put <laughs> it out there, yeah. I've put it out there. Um, one more sealed verse down. So the next sealed verse is said to be found in the Forest of Myth, where the, the party goes through an elaborate series of text-based adventures, which is another way to say, we ran out of budget and we couldn't afford to do another I dungeon. can't animate more. Um, how many sealed verses are we up to, and how many do we know? How many uh, we're I think aiming this is four. for? Okay, I think there's, I think there's five, and this is four. Yeah, we spent too um, much money on lingerie armor physics. <laughs> we're, we're stuck now. Yeah, so I, I have very conflicted feelings about the Forest of Myth because what it does is it's a really cool experiment, but it also is incredibly unnecessary, and a lot of people really hate it. Um, basically what they did was they said well we don't want to do just we didn't they wanted to do like not another dungeon so they did this like text-based choose your own adventure thing where you walk in and, and the story is there is this like shared death dream that the inhabitants of this forest are all kind of like under and it makes the game real trippy and weird so when you went when you walk up into the forest you like talk to somebody and it's completely normal and then the voice is cut out 
and then the UI gets all weird. And like you're used to seeing the font in a certain way. You're used to seeing the little like character portrait in the dialog box a certain way. And then the dialog box goes away. And then the dialog is just like over top of the screen. And then the screen fades to black. And it there's no like signal to this. It's just happening. And you're like, you're going through this dialogue. You're like, what the fuck is happening? This is really weird. And then all of a sudden the game is like, you're in the death dream. And then you have to like do a bunch of like memory puzzle solving, like choose your own adventure type puzzles to get your way out of it. So it's like, oh. you're in a corridor. Do you go left, right, or center? Like it's that kind of thing. Okay. I think it's really cool what they tried to do. Um, but they tried to like, they're in trying to make it challenging. It just was tedious. So gotcha. it, it, I don't think it came out the way that it was intended. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. So you do that, you get another sealed verse. Great. Um, so Nier returns home. One sealed verse left to go. He hears from Yona who, that she apparently has a pen pal who, who lives in this like isolated manor off the edge of town. Okay. All right. So Nier, Nier and Great. team head to the manor to investigate Yona's new boyfriend or whatever. <laughs> um, this is where the game gets really fucking weird. So inside the manor, we've already we've already seen a couple different like tropey game types, like the 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 text based adventure. Mm -hmm. Some of the some of the side quests before get a little weird, but this is where like the game gets very different. Like we immediately are we're in a this like spooky haunted house, and the colors get all washed out, and and the the entire section is riddled with these like Resident Evil style fixed camera angles. So it looks like you're playing like a Final Fantasy, like a PS1 game. Oh, okay. Um, which, is, which is really cool. Weird, but cool. And it's a cool aesthetic. Um, so you're walking around this manor and they're like, there are no enemies. They're just all these like weird, creepy statues of people that are just like frozen in place. And then there's also a weird robot butler or whatever. <laughs> That's fine. Had to um, put the robot butler in somewhere. Might as well you be gotta a, have a robot butler. house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do eventually encounter some shades because you need combat to keep this as a game and eventually uh near encounters this small boy who's just like playing the piano um he's blindfolded and he introduces himself as emil and that's image 15 he's a very fancy young young he's lad a, he's a oh. little a little fancy boy yeah he's a little he's fancy, a fancy boy, boy. <laughs> with yeah. his knickers and his knee-high socks <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's like he looks like the the berries and cream yes i was cream. just gonna say that <laughs> oh man <laughs> yep um so Emil, our good little boy Emil, uh, explains that his eyes petrify anyone who looks at him. Because of course they do. Because of course they do. Yeah. Um, so he has voluntarily blinded himself to avoid turning one else into stone. So all the stone statues that we saw were people that he just like... Medusa'd. He looked at. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, Emil believes that a cure can be found in the archives in the manor, deep inside the manor, but he can't get there because it's riddled with shades. Um... The robot butler comes back and informs us that it was him sending letters all along because he was trying to uh, uh, contact Nier to come and fight the Shades, but Yona responded instead. Uh. Mm, sure. So, uh, Nier, Kaine, Vice, and Emil all travel to the Manor Archives. And, and what's cool is when, when Emil... So, I should note, too, in, when you're fighting with your other party members, you only play as Nier but your other party members are there and they're participating and you, they'll like, they'll, they'll chime in with their own attacks. So like Kaine does a bunch of like magical blasts and she'll do some melee attacks. Emil will like Cyclops his way through a room. So he like grabs his blindfold and he like lifts it up and he's like, pew, pew, and he just hmm. starts petrifying everything, which is like pretty fun. Yeah. That's pretty rad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we get to the, the archives and we find, Another talking book who suspiciously looks just like Grimoire Vice, but is red and mean. And we fight him and we get another sealed verse. Cool. Do we not? Neat. Does this book not have a name? I forget. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the party heads back to the village just in time to get attacked by a massive army of shades le uh, led by this gigantic titan of a shamed shade named Jack of Hearts, which is image 16. Okay, that's rad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Load it. Okay. Yep. I'm into that. That's. Yep. 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 So this is your big. So we're at the 
you can tell as a player this is the definitive halfway point. We're at mm-hmm. the Temple of Time. We've just thrown in all the stones. We've gotten the Ocarina of Time. Shit's about to it pop off. Picked up your last party member. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, we have like this climactic battle. Near Vice, Kaine, Emil are fighting back against the Shades, but Jack of Hearts just can't be stopped. He's like slowly stomping through the city and you're just like whacking at his legs, but you just you can't do anything. They head him off at the library um, where Kaine makes this Hail Mary play. Um, earlier in the story, at one point, she tells him, you see her tell Emil like, hey, there's a certain point. We've all seen zombie movies. Yep, 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 <laughs> yeah. yep. Basically like, she was basically saying, like, when I tell you to petrify me, you have to do it. Because Kaine knows that her clock is ticking. She's going to be mm-hmm. turned into a shade. So uh, that was kind of setting this up. So she makes this Hail Mary play. She's like, Emil. She, so she, she kind of like, they chase this monster into a basement. She closes the door. And she's like, Emil, now. And Emil's like, I can't. I can't do it. She wants Emil to petrify her so she mm-hmm. can, like, lo- yep. you know, lock herself in. Um. And they have this like really kind of heartfelt moment. And Emil resolves to do it. He petrifies Kaine. And Kaine is now like Han Soloed against this door. Okay. Successfully, sure. therefore, successfully saving the town from destruction. She, she mm-hmm. Hodor'd cool. herself before, mm. yeah. before Hodor. Yeah. yeah. I, my, the imagery is very much Han Solo being blasted okay. in carbonite. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's, why, that's what I thought of. Um, I didn't put an image in here, but you can look it up. Um, so now enter the true villain, TM. Uh, he reveals himself as we see this shadowy figure who looks a whole hell of a lot like Nier float down um, that appears with devil wings. Uh. And, I, and I believe that is the next image in t- image 17 is, named the shadow I, Lord. Uh, I, I saw you labeled it as shadow lord and i was just hoping that that was like that it was the in parentheses name and not yeah. like no but that's the real name he looks a lot like near hmm. um but he's shade do you know if that's weird do you know if um if you play are playing the version as as daddy near it looks like daddy near or is it it looks like daddy near if okay. you're playing as daddy hmm. near yep um so shadow lord is also holding an unconscious yona uh and is accompanied by a floating black book so there's our black book uh. this is grimoire noir so near and grimoire vice fight off grimoire noir noir uh but he and the shadow lord are just too dang powerful and shadow lord escapes along with yona and near is left all alone that's a pretty bad ending for a game yeah, and that's it. And then roll credits. Oh, wow. That's a bummer. <laughs> um, that's a bummer. So we're going to take a break here because just like all good animes, we come back with a time skip, baby. A, a, th- <laughs> a third, a second time skip? We already time skipped. Oh, but we haven't gotten to see the characters age and become more edgier and grittier. Oh, okay. Also, Kyle, we haven't yeah. found the power of friendship yet, which I venture to guess is going to be oh, in here somewhere. Oh, it's coming, baby. Uh, <laughs> it's coming. The real the um, real grimoire was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> it sure was. Uh, all right, we'll stay right there. We will be right back after a short break. All right, we're back. <clears throat> it's been five years. Now, granted, it's only been 30 seconds, no, but yeah, I was just pretend it's been five years. Bit. Not five years. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. seem like a significant amount of time to, to really let it set in. Yeah. Um, it's been five years. Uh, to drive the point home that five years have gone by, Nier is bigger and way hunkier now and can also wield uh, two-handed swords and stabs. As um, you can see does in he have image a, 18. Does he have a beard or wear glasses? He doesn't have a beard. He doesn't does, have a beard, but he's, he's, he's bigger. He's adult Link now. Okay, but if, you are, but if you're daddy near, do you come back five years later with like a thick upper lip mustache? You have an eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you do. No, you're telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. Uh. 
What yeah, a bad so, deal for Daddy Near. Yeah. Daddy Near gets an eye patch. So um, there is a there is a point. Spoiler alert: We're gonna free Kaine. Uh, there's a point at which um, Kaine, like when you free Kaine, and because it's been five years, she's like because she's Kaine, she's like, oh shit, how long I've been out? And then uh, she she looks at she looks at Near, and if your brother Near, she's like, oh, you grew up. And then if you're if you're Daddy Near, she says. <laughs> You look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can so appreciate good. that. That's yeah. good. It's so yeah. good. Um, all right. So yeah, so we're we're older and uh just be- and because we're older, we're also way edgier now. Oh good. So we're yeah, we're dark near. So we've gone from Sonic to Shadow. <laughs> and uh darker, edgier near has been fighting off he's grizzled now. He's a, he's an old grizzled he's, man. He's seen he's some veteran. things and some stuff. He's seen some shit. And he wouldn't and recommend uh, any of it. Yeah. Um, there's a really fun little like side comment between Vice and Nier as you're so you're like when it when it kicks back in after the time skip, you're just like in the middle of the village fighting shades. And it's weird because shades haven't been in the village yet. Like that's your safety net. That's your that's mm-hmm. your your you know, it's your home base. And uh and he's like, Yeah, shades have been popping up everywhere lately. Seems like I can't get it. He's like five and then Grimoire Vice says five long years. <laughs> <laughs> like, good. awesome <laughs> um <clears throat> so older edgier near he's been fighting off the shades which are now armored i should say oh um, that's no because good. they've hmm. they've got a budget now um he's he's uh spending all of his time just frantically searching for yona but he has just been fresh out of leads he cannot find where the shadow lord is shadow lord is completely gone nobody knows where he, what this person what this thing even is um, Nier gets a letter from Emil, who asks him to meet him up at the manor. Emil and Nier have been in touch, but they're kind of doing their own things. Emil is still looking for a cure for not just himself, but now for also for Kaine as well. And, and, and I should know too, Emil and Kaine have this kind of connection. Um, they both are, you know, very much outsiders, and uh, they um, we'll see. We see later, like they've actually they really bond kind of in the background, which is interesting. Um, but they they you know. They have a lot in common. Um, and Emil takes it upon himself to, to cure Kaine because he, he feels responsible. So uh, he tells Nier to meet him at the manor. He says the answer lies in this abandoned laboratory underneath the manor. Oh, don't, so doesn't it always? It mm-hmm. always does. So we're gonna, it's time for some more Resident Evil shit. Um, so Nier, Grimoire Vice, and Emil all explore the laboratory and fight more shades now through an isometric overhead camera angle. So much like we did the fixed camera angles in the top level of the manor, now the game switches to like a top down where you can see all the rooms and you just see your little like near sprite um, kind of go from room to room. Why? So, it, I don't know. Okay. Why not? <laughs> why not? Um, it's a new dungeon. Go, it's a new mechanic, Todd. Sure. Yeah, like, whatever. Um, as they go deeper... Near finds all of these weird notes hinting at, wait for it, dark science and experiments mm. to create the quote, the ultimate weapon. Okay, this feel, feels um, right. Feels yep, like yep. we're about to get to an ultimate weapon time. I get <laughs> yep, it. Yep, yep, yep. So we get, we get these notes. This, we see several mentions of Project Gestalt and another thing called White Chlorination Syndrome. Oh, we don't really know what that means. That sounds real bad, though. Mm-hmm. It does. It does. Um, and as we go out through this dungeon, Emil starts to remember what actually happened and why he has these, petrifi- these petrified powers. As it turns out, Emil was born just an ordinary human boy and uh, lived with his older sister, sister Halua. Uh, the two kids were orphaned at a very early age and were taken in by Shadowy Science Inc. Shut to up. Be... <laughs> well, that's not the real <laughs> okay, thing. I'm okay, okay. Well, I wasn't. You can't Some be shadow sure. powers. Not, I know. I know. Y- yeah. We we weren't sure. That's fair. You can never be totally fair. Completely yeah. sure. Um, they were they were taken in by big evil science mm-hmm. and to be exper- experimented on with this dangerous magic. We'll we'll get a little bit more into why what that means. Um, Halua was codenamed Number Six and was designed to be the eponymous ultimate magic weapon. Oh, um, so we're doing an Evangelion, is uh-huh. is what you're telling me? Uh huh. Um, <laughs> Emil or Number Seven was designed to be her failsafe. Oh wow. So, yeah. So mm. she he was the he was the uh press of her emergency or break, in case of emergency mm-hmm. break glass. One day an emergency happened. Uh yeah. number six went berserk. Emil was brought in to petrify his sister to stop her rampage of destruction. 
the project was ultimately abandoned, deemed a failure, and just left basically like everyone left uh, Emil alone in this creepy Resident Evil ass house. And that's it. So um, we get to the bottom, we find number six, and we fight her, and she is on image 19. And uh, she looks like a giant spider skeleton. Who's, oh. She's like impaled against a wall with all these like steel beams. Um, but she's got, you should re- recognize that yep. head. Yeah. That is the Yoko Taro head. That sure is the Yoko Taro head. Yeah, it is. Okay, so sit, number six is the, the like red-eyed, weird-faced monster, not the small person standing in front of it, or are they both? No, number, number six. six is the red-eyed monster. So let's talk about the next one. So image 20. So actually what happens is we fight number six, Number six is too powerful because number six is an ultimate life form, just like Shadow the Hedgehog. Mm. And uh, and Emil actually ends up protecting Nier and tries to like reason with Halua, and we get this like anime flashback dream sequence. The ending result is Emil loses his human body and actually fuses together, fuses his consciousness together with Halua. So like Emil's mind kind of like meets whatever like remnants of Halua's humanity. And the two kind of mesh together and Halua basically like takes over a meal, but he, he keeps his consciousness. Basically the end result is that they two, they do a fusion dance and mm-hmm. we get new and improved Emil, which is an image 20. So that's a meal. I don't think any he's got, of that is new or he's got improved. That's a meal. <laughs> yeah. He's got a, now he's got a little cute little skeleton body and he's got mm-hmm. the actual Yoko Taro helmet head. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and now he is basically a god also. Oh. He has magical plot power. Okay. okay. Does he still petrify people with his eyes? He doesn't, no. Okay. He just well, has, that's he good. just has pink he just shoots pink magic. Okay. Um Emil, much like Kaine, people love Emil. He's like he is just like a cute little kid, but he's like, Hey guys, and he's but like he's like he's like that kind of energy, but he can also decimate an entire planet. Okay, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so Emil's got new powers now. So with using, taking Emil's new powers, the three return to the village and cure Kaine of her petrification. Hooray, we get Kaine back. Okay. Um, but by all extension, they also released that monster that her stone body was protecting. Remember that? That's why she did that. Um, no mm. problem though, because five years have passed. Nier is now a fucking brick shit house, <laughs> and Jack of, the, Jack of Hearts goes down no problem. Ah, and the gang is reunited at last. And there's there's a really there's a really touching moment. So obviously, like Emil is horrified with his new body. Like I say, new and improved, but he's like mm-hmm. terrified, right? And uh, there's this really touching moment where like you see Kaine wake up, and Emil's like he's like worried that Kaine is going to be afraid. Like people are going to be afraid of him, especially Kaine. And like she looks up and she looks at Emil. She's like, "Hey, Emil." He's like, "You knew who I was." She's like, "Of course I did." And it's like it's really it's really nice. It's really um, touching. Good. Um. Yeah, and that's when she says, you look like shit. <laughs> 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 Which is great. Um, so the gang, so the party's reunited. Awesome. Um, the gang heads back to, remember the Lost Shrine? That's where we found Grimoire Vice originally. They go back there. I honestly don't remember why. I don't know why they go back there. Because plot. It, I don't think it matters. Because plot. Um, and they, you ultimately fight one half of the two statues that you fight at the beginning of the game. It's the first boss battle. But this time, it's being covered by these hundreds of small little shades. They're just, like, crawling around everywhere. So we fight that, and we fight the shades off. And uh, we come across a fragment of this keystone. So we've got our next MacGuffin. Um, also, Kaine is critically injured again and is uh, taken over by the shade, who uh, is, like, in, in, in her left arm. Uh, um, yeah. So you have to fight shade Kaine, and you beat Kaine to near death, and then she snaps out of it, and she's all gone. Oh, like, good. Yay, kind is okay. <laughs> um, so we go back to the village talking with Popola. Popola tells us, well, if we can find the other parts of this keystone, then the completed piece will show us the way to the Shadow Lord. Okay. All right. Great. And, Let's do it. And yeah, and this is all a shadow the protagonist needs to move forward. So we do so. Um, so basically, Act Two just has us has us effectively retreading our steps from Act One. We're gonna remix all of the same places that we went to because this world is very small. It's the the dark so, the dark world when you in um yeah. Link to the Past you go mm-hmm. back exactly. and fight all the bo- bosses again, but they're different and darker now. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so we're going to first up is return to the junk heap. Remember those two old, the two brothers who were in the factory, yada, yada, yada. We learned that, uh, the older brother, Jacob actually died one year after we last saw them. Um, he died in a freak accident inside the abandoned factory. And in a flashback scene, we see this giant robot being driven by a little shade. who's like riding on its head, watching the whole accident happen. And it's implied that the, that the shade or the robot affected them. No. Okay. Um, now Gideon, Gideon is the name of the younger brother. The older brother is Jacob. Um, Gideon blames that rob- that robot for his brother's death, and uh, and charges near to go seek revenge on that robot. And there is some something to suggest that Gideon is not quite right in the head. If sure. you know what I mean. He's just like kill, kill, kill it, yeah, kill it, kill it. A little it. broken like, by the death very, of his twin brother. Yeah, which like. Fair enough. You're in a yeah. post-apocalyptic world and your only thing tethering you to life is gone. I get mm-hmm. it. So um, we do fight that robot. We find that robot. We fight that robot in a boss fight and uh, ultimately strike down the shade, uh, thereby securing our second keystone fragment. And uh, Gideon shows back in, back up because, of course, he does. And he's, we just see him like mindlessly kicking the dead husk of the broken robot, like maniacally laughing. And Nier's like, it, it's okay. You're done. It's, yep. it's cool. But like, we're... Are you done? And then we just like leave. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone backs out um, of the room like, all right. He's like, okay. <laughs> um, we go back to the forest again, and it's more text-based adventures. We do the thing and we get the thing. Not much more to say about Love that. It. Um, next stop, uh, we go back to our old friends at Facade. You remember the desert village? This is the mm-hmm. masked people. Um, we get an invitation from the king of Facade to attend his wedding. Um, we do, and we find out the surprise, he's getting married to Fira who is the young girl that showed us around five years ago because she's the only other named character that we meet in Facade. So, of course, they get married. Of course, yeah. The happy ceremony is interrupted by a pack of wolves terrorizing the town. Now, I should say, when you're going to Facade, you often are encounter you encounter wolves as like a normal fight. And and it's weird to see wolves in the desert because you wouldn't equate that, but the characters are like, eh, whatever. Um, but, but no, this pack of wolves just like up and up and terrorizes the town um, and you see they're all being led by this massive shade in the shape of like a, a, a wolf twice the size of the rest of them. The shade wolf shows up out of left field and just goes right for Fira, grabs Fira in his mouth, and then like whips her against a rock, and she dies oh. instant. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty brutal. And and you come to like, I really like the King of Facade. I think he's a fun character. Like you kind of, there's a couple cutscenes, and you're talking to him before the night of the red wedding. He's like, I don't know if I could do this. It's like, but you love fear. He's like, I do love fear. Like that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you like, you really feel, feel for him. And, and immediately like, he's just a broken person. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm, I don't care what happens. Like I am going to murder these wolves. Um, and then you, there's a scene with like him and the soldiers The soldiers are like, you can't do that. You're the King. Okay. If you're going to do that, then we're going to be behind you. So near joins the King and all of the soldiers of facade to go just fucking take out the wolves. So you go and you do that. You just murder a bunch of fucking wolves. Um, All right. One more fragment. Yay. <laughs> hmm. do, 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 do. Yeah. Uh, so our last fragment has us venturing back to the town of the Airy, which you may remember is where we first met Kaine. Now, what I didn't tell you about the Airy was that when you go there the first time, it's got this really ominous music playing and you don't actually see anybody in the town. You just see houses and there's like houses built on a cliffside. But when you walk by the houses, you get these little dialogue boxes that are like, go away, you monster, get out of here. You'll bring all of the, you know, they're just like, they're terrified and they want you to leave. It's not a very well, not a very warm place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we talked to Popola and Popola says, so basically tells you that the area has invited you to go to their farmer's market. Hmm. All right. Okay. So you're so you and Popola are near and Popola are both like, well, this is a trap, <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is a trap, right? She's like, yeah. And he's like, fuck it, I'm gonna go fight some shades because that's all that Nier cares about at this point. He's like, if they're shades, I'm gonna kill them. So you go to we go to the airy and uh oh dang, they're all shades. Oh <laughs> dang. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Really um, ruined my farmer's market morning. Yeah, so we fight the shades and uh they all form up and they morph into this gigantic eyeball. Um fun fact. The eyeball's name is Wendy, and Wendy is on image 21. Great. I w- how does it, how does the eyeball introduce itself 
as Wendy? Is it just does it like well, stop it, the action? Be like, hi, I'm Wendy the Shade Eyeball, and it I'm doesn't. Kill to be you. fair, they okay. all have, they all have names, but some of them they're just names on um on like title cards or like mm, boss cards gotcha. or health like health meter cards. This one in particular, there's an achievement, and it just is called Wendy. Oh, okay. great. When you beat Good. when you beat it. Good. Um, so the team fights back against the big old eyeball, but its power is growing rapidly. So, and, and of course, and Kainé gets critically injured again. Yeah. Um, this, this is the fourth time. And uh, Emil steps in to save the day. So Emil, we see this is the first instance of, of Emil's plot magic. Mm-hmm. Um, Emil launches this devastating magic blast that neutralizes the monster, but also blows up the entire town. Oh, okay. Well, you know, can't, can't make an omelet. Yeah, right. You know, uh, I feel yeah. like I feel like Kaine wouldn't wouldn't get into as much life threatening um, situations if she wore something more than lingerie into combat. I mean, you would think, right? Something that could like you know, after the second or third time at near death experience, she'd yeah. She'd you think you would make uniform a, up? I keep I keep make getting stabbed in my exposed thighs. <laughs> I should really <laughs> take care of that. Maybe some leather would help. I don't know. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. So the dust clears, and you're just the near Grimoire Vice, Kaine, and Emil are just staring at this like smoldering wreckage of a town that used to be a town that is no longer a town. And Emil is like obviously just horrified as what of what he's done. And the game does this really cool thing where you just see this group sit in silence, and it's just like they're just sitting there and like no one's saying anything because like what do you say? And and eventually Emil is like what have I done? Oh my God. And, and near does this really interesting thing. And this is where you see like near's character really start to shift because like near has near has gone from the old shucksy Google's kind of like child character to like, I am driven by blood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like in a very short amount of time and throughout the act two, he's just like, if there's a shade, we're going to kill it. Like he's just one track mind. And, and near looks at Emil and is like, well, you saved us. And no one says anything. Yeah. And it's just like, oh. Um, and you just walk away. Last shard acquired. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, like, wow. So, you head back to the village. Um, you update Popola on the fact that you got the keystone. Not that you murdered an entire village, but just that you've completed the keystone. And uh, you, what you would expect is, like, Popola gives you the information. Here's where you go. But what actually happens is you see Devil is also there. Now, we haven't talked about Devil in a, ra- in a while. She's Again, she's not really integral to the story up to this point. She's just kind of in the tavern and gives you side quests. So it's weird to see Devil here as well. And the two of them are, like, very apprehensive. So they're like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, we don't have to do this. And and Nier's like, yeah. Like, this was the whole point. What did you expect? <laughs> this is and what Popola's we've been like, doing. Mm-hmm. This is like, what are we? Yeah, what, what do you think we're doing here? And Popola is like, okay, well, go back to the Lost Shrine. <laughs> so go to the motherfucking Lost Shrine a third time. <laughs> and you go, up the, you go up the dungeon a third time to fight more shades to, to reveal that the entrance to the Shadow Lord's castle was conveniently right behind the, the wall where we originally got Grimoire Vice. Oh, Stupid. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Fine. So Behind, behind the plot wall. Yeah. So we... We do that, um, and we see near in the time near in the team arrived at the Shadow Lord's castle. Now, when I say Shadow Lord's castle, what does that make you think? Like, what would you imagine that is? Oh, well, probably something like a a medieval gothic looking castle, floating on a rock, probably in a void, mm-hmm. with a like yeah. sp- with like a weird twisty staircase that's too long and impossible connecting the two. Uh, dark yeah. clouds overhead of everything that Kyle said. Sure. Yeah, maybe yeah. thunderstorms. Thunderstorms Sans for sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, it's not any of that. Actually, mm-hmm. it's just a, a nice looking atrium that's overlooking yeah. a very modern looking city landscape that's also destroyed. Oh, hmm. okay. And that's when we find Popola and Devola are there waiting for us. Oh, oh, that's weird. Do we get yeah. their fun music as we walk into this thing we so, thought was going to be very bad? So this is where we find out what the fuck was going on all along. So you might have been kind of in the back of your mind, and I could tell in your voices, in my voice, saying, like, this all sounds very hacky. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's because it is. Yeah. Um, so this is very much like a, a uh, uh, fight club reveal where it was like, 
he was Edward Durden, Tyler Durden well, the whole time. The camera, the mm-hmm. camera angle shifts, and you get that yeah. sound and or, everything. Yeah, swirling. or like mm-hmm. Beautiful Mind when you find out Russell Crowe's been talking to himself. Like yeah. it's, it's that kind of thing. So here's what was actually going on the whole time. Let's rewind back just for a second, all the way back to the beginning of the episode. Remember when we talked about Drakengard and the big salt lady? Yeah, the kaiju. Yes. The kaiju. Yes. So, when the salt lady exploded, she exploded into thousands of these tiny particles called meso. Maso? I think it's maso, maybe maso, meso, it doesn't matter. M-A-S-O. This same element also came from the dragon that was shot down by the military. Maso introduced this very real world real version of modern day tokyo the magic but because this is a dark this is not a fantasy story because this is a a very cynical story instead of giving everybody magical powers Hmm. it just kicked off a pandemic that would eventually wipe out nearly all of the human race Uh, great sure yep (laughs) uh this pandemic was called white chlorination syndrome ah so what happened was White chlorination syndrome affected... So, uh, salt, big old salt lady appeared mm-hmm. in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo. Um, the military, f- when, upon seeing the first like threads of white chlorination syndrome, or, uh, re- realizing this was a pandemic, actually walled off Shinjuku and then eventually nuked it entirely. Oh, um, okay. that, that ultimately killed the like source... But at that point, white chlorination syndrome had already spread to other outlying countries, and it was effectively too late. This white chlorination syndrome just burned through humanity, and nobody could stop it. All right. What is white chlorination syndrome? Well, what it does is uh, when somebody gets it, they are forced, and I'm going to quote the wiki here, <laughs> they are forced to create a pact with an otherworldly god. Oh. Oh, okay. If they accept. They are turned into these monsters, part of this greater hive mind called Legion, because of course it's called Legion sure. and it's yeah. a hive mind. Yeah. Um, and if they refuse, their bodies turn to salt. Oh. So they're just statues, like salt state, salt statues. Mm-hmm. Um, so this thing just burned through, like just blew through humanity and nobody could, uh, could, could combat it. There's like this whole part of the near lore with this like 30 year war with the Legion and its leader called Red Eye that only exists in novels like <laughs> like like not novels, but like stories written in other games, like kind of like books are in Skyrim. Oh, and OK. Like these hmm. like side pamphlets, collections of these and also plays like one one off plays that aired in Japan years ago. <laughs> Oh, um, but sure. anyway, so there's this whole side story about this 30 year war against the Legion. And what's really it's not that important. A lot of people think that the next near game is going to be about this, but that doesn't matter. Um, what is important to know that an early discovery into this mass, this Maso uh, research found that the magic within Maso could actually be harnessed. Um, what it, but what the way that they could do that is they would need to separate souls from bodies, creating this soulless form called a gestalt, gestalt that could wield yeah. that could wield said magic as a weapon okay heartless heartless is. Um, yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah. yep mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we got that. uh so so emil halua and all the grimoires were all gestalts created using this technology as a means to fight off the legion okay okay that's all you really need to know about that long story short fast forward a number of years Humanity was facing extinction. Like 90, 95% of the world's population had, had turned to salt at this point. Humanity turned to Project Gestalt as a last ditch effort to save themselves, to, to avoid being completely wiped out. The plan was that survivors who hadn't yet succumbed to white chlorination syndrome would have their soul pulled from their body and basically just like wait out the pandemic. Meanwhile, there would be they would create replicant bodies from each of the host's DNA that could be used as a vessel for when it was safe to return. So these like husks called replicants mm-hmm. would just kind of hang out and wait for all of the disease to pass, and then the gestalts would rejoin with the replicants 
So it was like basically like freezing people. Yeah. Like yeah, it's cryo, the cry- playing like cryostasis. It's a, it's a magical version of mass cry- cryostasis. Yeah, magical version of ma- of cryogenesis. So the process would be facilitated by the Grimoire Noir, which is the Black Book, which was a which was mass produced and handed out to all the citizens. So what was happening back in the way back in the prologue was your main character Nier was creating a gestalt of himself. Oh, okay. and that's how he wielded that's how he wielded that magic. So he turned himself into gestalt, and he could use that that book magic and fight off the shades. Um, however. Project Gestalt was flawed from the beginning. Um, little was known about this technology, obviously, and many of the early Gestalts would lose all their sense of identity and consciousness and basically go like go feral, um, which had they had labeled as relapsing. Guess what? These were the shades that we were fighting oh, all along. Oh, okay. darn it. Oh, right. man. Yeah. Oh, dang. So, so those are Gestalts. So shades are Gestalts. However, there was one particular Gestalt that succeeded for whatever reason that's unknown. And when Nier touched that book, that was the first perfect Gestalt that was created. So Nier, our uh, protagonist, was effectively the blueprint for all future Gestalts. Okay. Um, when Yona touched that book, though, I should note, Yona touched it before Nier um, had already started the process. Her process was imperfect. Hmm. So that'll come into play. That'll come into play but, a little bit later. Yeah. So, so we learned this is the big reveal that the Nier we've been playing this whole time is actually the replicant version of Nier. Gotcha. From the prologue. And as well as everyone that we've ever interacted with on this world is a replicant. Okay. Um, Great. All by right. extension, the, the Black Scrawl, the thing that was affecting Yona and it killed so many people. The Black Scrawl is something that affects replicants. When their associated Gestalt relapses, the Black Scrawl takes over the replicant because there is, like, it's basically severed the tie. Like, the soul has severed the tie with the body or whatever. Yes. So, Yona, Yona's Gestalt was imperfect when she touched that book. But Nier, the perfect Gestalt, tried to, like, contain it. So, Yona, Yona's replicant, had that black scrawl and Yona's replicant, like that's like the seventh or eighth replicant of Yona and each replicant that, that the original near gestalt made was imperfect because the original copy was wrong. Okay. Mm. So that Yona is, is destined to die. Like yes. she, she cannot be seen. Yes. Hmm. Okay. So, um, Popola Devila, meanwhile, are revealed to be, androids sure right. okay yeah they're, there it is <laughs> they're 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 a they're a, a a set of androids developed created specifically to protect and watch over the replicants and await the time that they could finally reunite the gestalts with their replicant bodies um and the way that they would do this and mass is to combine the magic of grimoire vice with the magic of grimoire noir, noir. okay okay mm-hmm. which Vice had since forgotten about conveniently. Yes. Well, the, yeah, he had amnesia. We, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, big exposition dump. Questions? No. We so <laughs> so. You said this is like the we are so many. We are seven or eight replicant versions of Near and yeah. um mm-hmm. and his sister Yona. from the prologue. Exactly. Okay. We don't know exactly how many, but like sure. again, like fourteen hundred years worth. Yeah, they've mm-hmm. gone through a few. Okay, yeah. and and we know Yona's been stolen, been kidnapped by Shadow Near Shadow Lord Shadow Lord <laughs> <laughs> or or God. Near Gesh- or the Gestalt Near Gestalt Near. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna figure yeah. out why. So here soon. The reason the 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 hand wavy reason for why the main plot of this game is so hacky is because oh it's by design the androids made it that way you know they live in this like fantasy village to protect them to protect the replicants to give them something to do gotcha yeah. gotcha but the but the thing with the replicants is much like Detroit become human that's where that that connection is made mm-hmm. the replicants just gain sentience 
and they kind of like grew a soul of their own. So they are not these mindless husks. These are people. Sure. Um, right. And that's why Project Gestalt failed. Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, really weird. Kind of cool. Very kinda cool. Weird. Yeah. I'm yeah. into that. Yeah. It's not. It's not terrible. It, it's. It's very interesting. I mean, I. I definitely like went down the <laughs> the old <laughs> rabbit hole on on Wiki for it. Um. So after the big exposition dump, we have the big climactic fight with Popola and Devla. And they basically reveal like we're gonna. St- our goal was always to stop you here, yada yada yada. And it's emotional. It is because these are like you know near near actually says at one point like Popola was like my mother. You know like these yeah. are like these are my closest friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked about this is where I think Todd you asked this earlier. Does that song come back? Absolutely, it does. <laughs> nice. Right it's here. a battle theme version, and it fucking rips. That's awesome. Yeah, and I've got a I've got a link here, a Spotify link. Um. And we fucking murder Devila. We just straight up murder her. And you nice. hear, you watch Devila die. Oh, good. Like, it's rough. And, like, Popola's like, Devila, no. And she's like, you monster. She freaks out. She's like, why would you do that? And then uh, Nier says something like, let's stop now. Like, let's, we're, like, let us go. Let's stop now. And she's like, stop? You want to stop after you kill my sister like an animal? And then she, like, flips out and nukes the, starts to nuke the entire building. Well, Emil steps in with his magical plot armor and <laughs> shoots the shoots the rest of his friends, literally like shoots them out in a magical bubble. And he goes, don't worry, guys, I got this. And he like flies back and he like suicide bombs Popola with magic. He blows himself out. And you, you hear Neil, Emil's theme, which is like really sad. Mm-hmm. And it kind of and it sounds like a, a young child singing it, young ch- choir boy singing it. I'll play it here. I'll, I'll pop it in here. Um, as you see, like Emil slowly sacrifice themselves and they're like flying away. They're like, no, Emil. <laughs> Um, oh man! So, yeah, that's tough. So we've uh, we've got near Kaine and Vice left. They're fighting their way through the Shadow Lord's castle, and we've got there's some other unique um, fights that you know are revealed to be really really rough. But we won't talk about. Um, and we finally get to the Shadow Lord, aka near Gestalt near, mm-hmm. um, who is watching over a sleeping Yona, who is also aged five years. And we fight them. We fight Grimoire Noir and Shadow Lord. It's the big the final big, battle. The big fight. The big fight. Um, we win because we're playing a video game and we're finally reunited <laughs> with Yona. Um, except once we're reunited with Yona, she doesn't recognize us because Gestalt Nier has already tried to fuse Gestalt Yona with oh. the repli- with her replicant's body. Mm. And but replica Yona actually, like we see, she says something. She says this body belongs to somebody else, and she misses her brother. And she looks at protagonist near at replicant near. She says, "You're him, aren't you?" And then like she, she says something like she she's she's been waiting for you or something. And then rep uh, Gestalt Yona just like disappears and flies into anime space, anime heaven. Um, okay. So we then murder Gestalt near. Like we just like we stab him. We stab him good. Stabberate him right right there, right then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there. and 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 he goes to anime heaven. Roll credits. <laughs> Okay, one playthrough done. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Were you waiting? Were you waiting for that? I, I mean, I, there's. I know that there's at least e worth of endings. No, that was another game, Todd. Yeah, no. yeah but I still no. imagine there's multiple <laughs> endings here. Do you want to know how many endings there are in Near Automata? How no. many? Less than Bomberman games. <laughs> <laughs> there are twenty six. <laughs> oh. That's <laughs> literally one one for every letter of the alphabet. Now, that now, to be fair, most of them want to die. To be fair, most of them are joke endings. They're like fail states. But okay. one of them is a secret boss, and then the other, there are actually five real ones. And and what that represents, and Near Autonoma does something that Near tried to do, but it does it better, which is the idea of playing through a game, but then playing through it again with a different perspective. Right. Um. Mm-hmm. Which so when you play a Near game. When you roll the credits the first time, you're not actually done. You have not completed the story. Um, it is a fake end. It's a fake credits. It's like when you beat K. Rule on Donkey Kong Country and it says mm-hmm. the end. Right. It's Question like mark? Like there's, there's more. There's, there's more to go. We got more to do. Yeah. Yep. Um, Nier Automata did this well where when you play through the first game, you play through as the story's main protagonist. Her name is 2B. She's an android. It's the whole other thing. And then you play as a different protagonist, 9S. Now, you, hmm. you go through the same story beats and play the same fights, 
but 9S handles completely different. He does like a hacking thing. So it's a completely different game, essentially. Sure. Hmm. And then there's a third playthrough as a third character that's just new content. So it is effectively like, it feels more like a different game. Near Replicant, on the other hand, you literally do just play through the game again, um, but with added cutscenes and story beats. Right. So again, to add to the grindiness of Nier, like you have to play through the second half of the game, which like combat wise doesn't really change anything. It's new game plus, so you can kind of like tear ass through everything, but you're really just like rushing for to get to new cutscenes and skipping a lot right. of dialogue. Right. Mm-hmm. Sure. Granted, like I blew through each of the second and third playthroughs like in one night but still like it's time so let me let's get through it um i'm I'm only going to talk about like the added story beats so it's there's not that much to talk about but um when you start through the second playthrough or route b if you will you we open with this novel a a novel scene kind of like um the text chain that we saw in the forest of myth um we get this this new novel dialogue talking about all of Kaine's background and we hear Kaine's theme in the back and Kaine's theme I haven't talked about it yet it's another one it's very soft it's very gentle um very not like Kaine as a character at all Kaine as you can imagine went through some shit as sure. a kid. um and mm-hmm. this is where we learn that so we learn that Kaine is actually intersex um and oh. but she and 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 again like the stories, the hand wavy reason for that is something, something her replicant creation didn't work. Like whatever, who cares? Sure. Okay. Um, but regardless, Kaine identifies as female, um, but was ridiculed as a child. And, and mm. the people of the area are not nice people. Like they are monsters. And Kaine's childhood was a nightmare. And like she, we get to see the story of her just like having rocks thrown at her. Like she's not very accustomed to, uh, to being tortured. Basically. Gotcha. Um, she grew up an orphan in the area. Um, she was, by all accounts, the village pariah. Um, this old lady uh, took her in and effectively became her grandmother, which kind of mentions her grandmother in the first playthrough, but we don't really get any context to that. So we get that context now. So we, we see, we learn about Kaine living with this old sassy lady who cursed like <laughs> a sailor, but like loved Kaine. Very much like, uh, do you remember um, when I talked about Dr. Kareha in the yes. uh, One Piece episode, The Crazy Witch, yep. or The Crazy mm. Witch Doctor? Very much like those vibes. Okay, okay. And, and the two of them lived happily together in their, like, you know, their sitcom-y um, household outside of the skirts. <laughs> and then one day the Fire Nation attacked. Yeah. And then one day the Fire Nation yep. attacked. <laughs> A massive shade attacked part of their village and uh, obviously killed Grant, Kaine's grandmother and left Kaine critically wounded mm-hmm. <laughs> but still alive um during that time kaine was out cold another shade attempted to possess kaine's body um and somehow ended up fusing to her left arm and left leg so that okay. is why kaine is part shade gotcha that shade has a name that shade's name is tyron and he's a serial killer oh <laughs> oh <laughs> yep. He, he literally he's like oh here we go we'll kill him again oh i don't like <laughs> any of that I nerp, 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 nerp. yeah so he's and he's got the voice like hey kaine why don't you go kill that guy yeah. vision baby <laughs> vision baby <laughs> yeah he's like that and so um so part of route b is you're hearing tyron talk to kaine it's kind of like kaine's perspective but you're still playing as near um but because Kaine can hear Tyron and talk to him. It's like voices in her head. She can also understand shade language. Hmm. And that is the rationale for Route B's change in context. Gotcha. So Route B is, again, we're going to play the same game, but we're going to realize how much of a monster we really are. Nice. Good. Gotcha. Because remember, the shades are not monsters. They're yeah. just They're people. humans yep. who were tricked into, into turning their souls into books or whatever. Yep. So, um... Yeah, so we can so we get all the extra context. So all those boss fights before, now we start to see these extra cutscenes and like what was actually going on. Um, so Route B actually begins right after curing Kaine's petrification. So we don't do the mm-hmm. uh, the mansion thing again. It's okay. just the last like second half of the second act. So it's not a large portion of the game, gotcha. but it is significant. Yeah. Um, it's just getting all the Keystone fragments. Um. So the first one, uh, you may remember when we went to the Lost Shrine the second time, we fought that statue who was surrounded by all those little shades. Well, as it turns out, those shades are children. They're school yeah. children. Uh, and uh, and beans. Uh, uh, beans. And uh, 
they're just like hanging out with the statue and the statue is like really sad because you already killed his twin brother who's mm-hmm. the other statue <laughs> and he finds all these shades he's like get away i'm i'm not like i'm not one of you and the shades are all like no it's cool we're little kids or whatever and then they're just like playing and you see this like montage of them playing and he's like we're gonna be friends forever oh, <laughs> <geez>. <laughs> oh man yeah no that so has <laughs> that has a lot of the same energy of the skyrim subquest where you go and murder a town of goblins and you find out it was just people but you had had like a spell cast on you to think yes. they're goblins this is the same deal same energy. Yes. okay you are the monster and yep. you are the monster yeah so um because and again like when you're fighting these things the first time you hear them kind of like a it's just like this garbledy noise which you don't think you're like out of of my way i'm the hero yeah yeah exactly you don't think anything of it but they're talking and now you get those dialogue boxes (laughs) so the whole time you're fighting the shade the statue he's like they're just children please stop leave us alone oh no (laughs) you're you're murdering the younglings um so you do that you murder all the younglings and uh and now we go we learn so fast forward to the junk heap section um that big robot that was driven being driven by a shade yeah that the wasn't one, the he one wasn't that killed the to- brother yeah yeah mm-hmm. that shade was not telling that robot what to do that shade was just another child who had watched his mother die uh, um, oh. and he and there's a scene where the little shade finds this dilapidated dumpy looking robot and names him beepy oh <laughs> <laughs> oh it. andrew and they're literally like we're gonna be friends forever <laughs> <laughs> i'm noticing a theme here yeah. and then and then a um, band of and then a band of warriors yeah, tears I, in and- I swear if one of these is like you know a person is retired after 50 years of loyal work <laughs> at like an orphanage and it's like see you later yeah. sharon you you really gave us 50 quality oh my <laughs> god <laughs> yeah oh man um also, the we it's revealed that the robot did not kill Gideon's brother. Gideon, the the, the younger brother, like tripped over a beam and, and call, he, caused and he, another thing he bumped to the lever fall and, and crush. He bumped yep. the lever and it swung the thing and actually it killed mouse, his yeah. brother. It. Yeah, uh, yep. It was just a freak accident. Uh, I hate it when um, that happens. Yeah, ah, dang. Uh, we learned that. Remember the wolf that attacked Facade and you yeah. know grabbed that like violently grabbed that girl and threw, slung her against the wall. There was no rhyme or reason for that, right? Well, there was. <laughs> sure, there was. Um, what actually happened was the soldiers went and went on a mur- a wolf murder and rampage the night before because they were just like going on a pre wedding bender. Oh, and as you do, as you do, and you see, you see the the shade wolf find the corpses of like thirty wolves, like all uh, like just murdered in cold blood, and it's like, why would they do that? And, and then the shade wolf says brothers we charge <laughs> we charge at dawn yeah um and then finally the airy um remember the airy was the place that that fun little farmer's market it wasn't a real oh, yeah. farmer's market. oh yep yep it was so, just a real farmer's it was market. just a That's farmer's the market and well the plot. just it, was it wasn't it market. wasn't it wasn't it wasn't i actually this one is the most unclear i think this is one is up to dramatic interpretation my interpretation of the airy is that they are, it's a town of shades mm. um, because what what we find is that shades can possess human or possess replicants or pass themselves off as humans and i think that's what happened i think the airy is a town full of sentient shades that have not relapsed yet okay. and are trying to hide um, from the ones who have it's not explicitly stated, but I think that's what's happening. Gotcha. Um, there is a scene where, and you see it in the original, in the first playthrough too, where you're fighting and this like this brother, or do you see Kaine stab this woman? And you're like, Kaine, what the fuck? And she's like, this woman is a shade. And you're like, oh, cool. And then you stab her. <laughs> oh. oh. It's not clear if that woman was actually a shade or not. Yeah. yeah. And it becomes even less clear in the second playthrough. You're like, yep. oh no, you're just murdering this village. Yep. And then... Emil like blows it up to to get rid of any witnesses. <laughs> oh. Great. Yeah. Okay. And there's literally there's literally dialogue that you see that's like literally like not subtle. You are the monsters here. <laughs> Why are you doing this? You know. <laughs> so like there is it's impossible that you are not feeling like an absolute piece of shit at this point for for fighting all these shades. So you go through the Shadow Lord's castle again, you take him down. This time we see ending B, B as in boy, which reveals that Emil actually survives that suicide bomb 
that magic bomb and now just lives in the desert as a head, as a rolly head. Oh. Because near because near is an uh, Emil is an unkillable god. Great. Um I have here in our notes Emil will, will return in near automata. <laughs> I have I think I have a question. Yeah. Um Kaine speaks the language of the shades. Why she does not, she not relay any of this? Why does she not relay any of this? To near? It's a great question. Um I think because you hear so that's that's something i asked myself too and and there's an interesting thing where you hear in the first playthrough every once in a while kine will be like shut up shut up i don't care like stop talking Mm -hmm. and you're like what the fuck are you like what is happening you have no idea you have no context Mm -hmm. well those shades are talking and the whole time kine is like shut up shut up because the thing is like kine needs to justify to herself why she keeps killing these shades sure and and like humanity there are some people who are just inherently bad. Mm-hmm. The shade that attacked her village, the shade that possessed her and is a serial killer, they're bad dudes. They're, like, bad, they're just bad, they're bad people. shades. Gotcha. Yeah, they're just they're just shades of bad people. Not all people are bad. Mm-hmm. Hashtag not all people. But um, but Kaine needs a reason. Bold and this stance. goes back to right. <laughs> and this goes back to that idea. Like, remember the whole like Yoko Taro was interested in the September 11th nationalism and like. Yes. What it what how would somebody justify mm, okay. genocide? Basically, how would just somebody justify killing on both sides? Gotcha. Well, that's it. That's how. You know, she's like, these are monsters. I I don't I'm not listening. Sure. These that's, are monsters and I need to protect myself. I mean that's, that's and that's that's a fine explanation. Like I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with that. I yeah. just the more I was watching this, I was like, she can hear them. Yeah. yeah she super can. And she and, and she doesn't deny it either. Mm. So yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, Later on, she's like, oh, yeah, shit, those are kids. Yeah. <laughs> eh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, but again, like, it puts more context. Like, that scene where they're sitting outside the area and they're just, like, sitting in silence. Like, she knew way more shit yeah. that was going on than he did. Yeah. Hmm. So. Um, yep. Okay, so we got one more playthrough. Now, again, now, the third playthrough to get to ending C and D, definitely, like, there's no value there. You don't get mm-hmm. any extra content. You're just playing through it all again. So I'm literally just like skipping dialogue. Um, not worth mentioning. Once you get through and beat it a third time, you get another boss battle after Shadow War. And we see that Kaine is finally starting relapsing and she's about to completely lose her, con- her sense of self. So we got to take her out. It's time. We got we to, gotta, you know, pull the trigger. Um, Tyron talks directly to Nier for the first time. And Nier at this point is like, what the fuck? Um, Tyron says either kill her to put her out of her misery or kill yourself, which in turn would restore her humanity. Okay. So that's your decision. Hmm. So ending C is you kill, you kill Kaine. Gotcha. Nier and Yona go back and live the rest of their life. Ending D, you kill Nier, mm. you restore Kaine's humanity. And this is where the game gets a little psycho manis. So mm-hmm. when the game tells you, like, if you say like, it basically says, like, if you choose to kill yourself, you will cease to exist. Or, but you won't just cease to exist. You will erase yourself from history. That means nobody will remember you, hmm. and you will have never, ever mattered, basically. Yeah. Like the replicant. Yeah. The game's iteration of that is it actually goes through, and it says, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? If you say yes, it deletes your entire save file. Oh, Very wild. Yeah. Nice. And it goes through every single page of your like menu screen because it has like your collections, your quests, your equipment, and it deletes it one by one. So it takes like fucking five minutes. <laughs> and you just watch all of the progress that you've made just get, get deleted. Out. Get huh. cleared. Fantastic. You cannot access that save file. It is gone forever. You can't even start a new game with that same name. That's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. Did you did you get to this ending yourself? Mm-hmm. I had to. I had to because uh, near replicants near the near replicant remaster added a fifth ending. Okay. Which actually takes place after you completely uh, wipe. The I have, I have two follow up questions <laughs> to go, that. Go One, did you know what I did? You knew the ramifications. Yes, so you, I, I watched a, I, I looked, I was following along on a spoiler free ending guide as I am want to do with games. Like this. Gotcha. And did you, which, which did you pick? Who did you kill? Oh, I did both. Um, oh, okay. I just saved. I saved a, a file before, so I actually I fought the Shadow Lord like four times. Gotcha. Um, I saved a file beforehand, and yeah, 
So I went through ending C and then went through. That's all I had. Um, my did you have a question, Todd. Yeah, I did. So you said we're going to this last ending, which is a special, important ending. Yep. And you said this is this is the fifth ending. Yes. And I'm noticing what is the fifth letter of the alphabet? It's ending E. e. Everything uh... is ending E. <laughs> Yeah, I've got uh, yeah, I've got, I've got Jack the red Gar- lines on my wall, all pointing to big E's. I, I think that's actually a coincidence, but it does it does turn out that Drakengard went to ending E. Near Automata has an ending E is like the final ending, quote unquote. And originally, Near did not have an ending E. They just added this in this in this remake version. Andrew, the, I don't worth. think you're seeing all the connections that I see as a <laughs> okay. as a true believer of Eonon. I gotta tell Todd you, Todd is E's Todd everywhere. is vibrating right now. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, well, we're almost done. I just want to touch on... That's basically near in a package. I want to touch on a couple other points about the remaster and then the lead up into Automata. Um, but we are... Give me five more minutes here and then we'll be, we'll be, we'll be out. So um, 2021's remake added a bunch to repackage it as near replicant version 1.22, da 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 as we talked about. Um, so obviously, you know, we, they retooled the combat system, which was very good. Um, they made the combat system from bad to... Eh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, overhauled the graphics, and the game looks fucking beautiful. I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, it it should be noted that again because Near was a 2010 game, it was a very gray and orange game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and if you see look up screenshots, it's also very. It looks like Twilight Princess, like the same art style where everything oh. is like kind of fuzzy and and orange because they didn't want to account for a long draw distance, so they just said everything's fuzzy. Um, gotcha. Yeah, yep. it's got that. It's got that that. PS3 Gen Haze. Yep. Um, so it's it's a beautiful game. It really is. Um, but most importantly, Near Replicant added a new side story that actually takes place during Act Two, uh, just like another encounter, and then this final fifth ending E. Um, e is an ending. Uh, so real quick, I'll just touch on that new side story. It's it's fine. It's it's interesting. I I didn't realize it was an ad until afterward. I I thought it was kind of a waste um but it was kind of a cool exploration i guess um it would have been dlc if it were you know another yeah. situation yeah so basically we see near and the crew are investigating a wrecked ship um you go through this thing it kind of looks like castlevania where it's like a 2d so we've we've done isometric we've done resident <laughs> evil fixed camera now we're on 2d side scroller um and we're and you're kind of like investigating this like this wrecked pirate ship and you find all these documents and it's kind of like you're on the trail of what looks like this like little ghost girl. Um, basically, you find out that there's this ghost girl that's been living in the ship, and this very well-meaning but but blissful, blissfully ignorant postman has been coming and feeding her. Uh. But you, but Nier and Kaine and Emil immediately realize, like, oh, this girl is a shade, and she's gonna kill us, and <laughs> she is, and she does. So nice. this this little ghost girl turns into this massive kraken, and you're fighting a tentacle monster on a ship because it's a video game and you need to fight a kraken on a ship. <laughs> right, right. Get to check that box. Um, so much like what Route B does is adding extra context. The extra context to this fight is that that shade was a human, was a little girl obsessed with becoming human. So much so that she tried to like make herself look like a little human girl, um, but she looked like a ghost or whatever. Right. But she fooled the postman, who was kind of an idiot. Um, the postman was like, she kind of like saw in him like a like a kind of like a, a dad, yeah, dad character. A, a kindly, you know, he was like giving her a kindly, kindly old stranger, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And she like became obsessed with idea, this idea of becoming human, and like wanted to look more human. So she started eating people. Fair. All right. You know how you become they, human by eating people. Well, you yeah. know what they say: you are what you eat. Yep. Oh, good. There it is. Like, as a bug snacks deal. This is like we're bug not, snacks. We're not talking about bug snacks. Everyone's talking about bug snacks. A lot of great anyway. people talking about bug snacks. <laughs> yeah, a lot of all the people. Um. Anyway. Uh. Yeah. So you find like there's this like oh this boat is riddled with corpses. <laughs> it's all <laughs> just a boat, boat full of corpses. <laughs> Yellow corpse boat. Um. So you fight off the big kraken and uh, the last like. There's this 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 sequence where the Kraken girl um, is like charging up this big old attack, and you're not powerful enough to stop it. So it like almost like completely obliterates your party. 
but the last second the postman steps in he's like <laughs> beating one of the tentacles with this like piece of driftwood it's like clearly not doing anything but he's like you're ugly I'll, no one will ever love you ah! and the girl like stops everything and just like kills herself ah wow that's <laughs> that's a bummer yeah 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 so that's that's that story um the i'm not gonna get too much of in the ending e because honestly it's kind of heady and doesn't make a lot of sense unless you knew, know you're near automata so i'm just gonna take talk about it in, in high strokes so broad strokes so basically what happens is you actually have to go through the first few hours of just a brand new new game like well because you I deleted had your old one yeah. yeah yeah i had to start a new save file and get to the point that i beat the uh scorpion boob monster okay um the boob scorpion mm-hmm. yep uh and then at that point if you guys remember like the first time kind of gets critically injured um she's like in scary anime dream death world well this time she gets drugged down to scary anime dream death hell oh, oh no and then you just wake up as kaine and it's five years later it's after the events of ending d okay so okay. kaine kaine is just living her life as a human but she has all these weird memories of this this mysterious figure who she who has been cut out of her actual memory. You know another game that did this, Kingdom Hearts Chain yeah. of Memories. Uh, <laughs> it's um, it's a Kingdom anyway, Hearts again. It all, it all comes full circle. Well, kind of replicants are nobodies after yeah, all. Yeah, that's that's true. That yeah. is true. That is true. Um, anyway. So you play as Kaine, which is pretty cool. So they added this whole camp, this whole mini campaign where you get to play as Kaine, and she's trying to figure out why she has these dreams of this like person who's been cut out of her memory. And you eventually meet up, and she's like, because history was rewritten, she saved Yona, she saved the town from the shades. Mm, gotcha. She's mm-hmm. the hero oh, because okay. Nier is completely unwritten. Hmm. Yona does not have a brother. So that's that's an interesting thing. So um, you don't go too far. Like, you don't actually see Yona. She just talks about her like, oh, I better go check on Yona, but she never does. So the actual campaign is just you go to the Forest of Myth and you actually go inside this tree that it's revealed that the tree is actually a digital mainframe that's recording all of the memories and thoughts and history or whatever. It's fine. You go inside the tree okay. and the tree is full of wires. Sure. Sure. Um, and you do like a little mini dungeon inside the tree and then it gets really weird and heady where you're like in a computer simulation kind of and it's again it's referencing a lot of stuff that happens in near automata mm. which is all about androids and and mm. it's basically blade runner um mm. but it's really cool and it deals a lot with uh Kine's backstory and her like inner trauma and you fight the boob scorpion again um, oh. But now you fight the boob scorpion with all of the context that that boob scorpion killed her grandmother and has been tormenting Kaine her entire life. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Um, and it's much more powerful. And then you're fighting to get the memory back of Nier and Grimoire Vice. And you get and at point, one point, like you, you, uh, you're having a hard time. It's impossible. You cannot beat the boob scorpion. And Grimoire Vice shows up, and you get to use Grimoire Vice. Nice. And he's just like, he's like, hello, hussy. Because he calls her hussy all the time. Nice. Sure. Um, and then it's like, all right, let's go beat it, hussy. She goes, cram it, book. And it's really fun. And I <laughs> Is that when she calls bit. the book a bitch? Is that that moment? <laughs> that actually, that happens uh, the first time they meet the Shadow Lord, but that's fine. Sure. Um, they can't save yeah, that A plus content for that late game. Yeah. Right. So right. It, it's fun. So it, it's very much fan service. You get, you know, you get more kind name, more grimoire vice. And then you, the ending is you, uh, you reunited with Nier and they all hug and everyone's happy. Um, I want to talk really quickly about Nier's sequel. I put it in your quotes, Nier Automata. Um, now the story technically follows Nier, but it actually takes place 10,000 years oh. <laughs> after the events of so the original our Nier. time jumps have been like a thousand, like one point. We went a yeah. thousand, and then we went five. Five. Ten thousand. So it'll be ten years next, and then... 20 26 000 years yeah yeah it's it's the allure it's the year 11 5 4 6 i don't care <laughs> no one who's listening to the story cares no one uh, who read that number on the screen when they played this no. game cared it's five digits like my brain can't yeah. even process that 
anyway, so we find so replicant because replicant near killed Shadow Lord, aka Gestalt near. He effectively wiped out humanity's last chance at life, and now humans are extended. Dead. Humans do not well, exist. And without Gestalts, yep. Okay, and without the Gestalts, the replicants can't exist either. So all the Gestalts or replicants have been gone for thousands and thousands of years. Mm. Androids like Popola and Devla are now the only things that are even remotely tied to what was once the human race. Now, at some point, a massive alien army invades Earth and leaves behind a series of these dumpy-looking robots. Also, Emil is a turtle and creates thousands of copies of himself to fight the aliens. Of course. So, yep. so Near Automata focuses on a series of androids who show up on Earth to fight back the robots, thinking that they are fighting for humanity, but when reality, humanity is extinct. And the big spoiler, the big plot twist with Near Automata is that if you, it, this was a plot twist to me because I hadn't played Near, the big plot twist is the humans were extinct all along. Oh, okay. um, and if you had played near, you know that you'd have picked but, up on that before, or, or you would be like, "That's weird." I thought that whatever. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's it. Um, that's near, and uh, boy, howdy, is it a story? Um, what do you guys think? Um, I really liked that. I don't remember if I said this on air or off air at the beginning, but um. A the only thing I knew about Near was a tweet where someone said it's what Kingdom Hearts wish it wished it could be, yeah. mm. and that's very much the case. Like it's a yeah, it's Kingdom Hearts with all the all the dumb Kingdom Hearts in it, but yep. with but better, but better with all the like dumb we didn't care about the plotness of it taken out. Yeah, yeah. I would just I don't have a lot more to add other than what Kyle said. Like knowing. Knowing the Kingdom Hearts story and then hearing this and you're yeah. like, no, this was what I meant to hear the first time. Yeah. Like this yeah. is these are the, the twists of who <clears throat> who's a soul or who's a heartless, who's not a heartless. Like this is what I want. Yeah. And and the the I mean, that is a, a very good twist that you are just like mm -hmm. genociding humans the whole yeah. You, yeah. you find out you're you're just genocidal monsters the whole time. And, yeah, um, I I love a good we are the monsters yeah, take. Yeah, and I'm always down for that. Um, that's great. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed that. Um, if you're listening, uh, you know, thanks for thanks for thanks for hanging out with us. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Now you don't have to go play near, and that's really that's great. Um, I <laughs> the did greatest it for gift, you, so you don't the have greatest to. gift <laughs> of all, the greatest gift because it's such a great story. Just a fucking bummer to play. Um, go listen to the soundtrack though. The soundtrack is very good, and like I said, it is on Spotify. Um. And go play Near Automata because that game fucking rips. And I did not spoil the actual twist. So, um, what what consoles are these on? Can I play? Ooh, yeah, good question. Can I play um, the remake on my PS4, or do I need a PS? You can play both. It? You can play Automata and Replicant both on PS4. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there are also PC ports. I will say I played the Automata PC port. I did not have a problem with it, but there is a lot of discourse about the PC port. A lot of people do not like it. It is apparently riddled with problems. I did not experience said problems, but I didn't play the console version either. So, Gotcha. Didn't have a point of reference. Awesome. Well, that's going to do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for listening in to debate this. As always, you can follow along with the arguments on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at DebateThisCast or on our website at DebateThisCast.com. And once more, if you want to commission your own flavor text and hear more about the Nearverse, maybe you want to get more Near Automata, huh? maybe you want to get some Drakengard, we're not going to do Drakengard, then check out our <laughs> Patreon page at patreon.com slash debate this cast. And if $50 is too big a commitment, consider instead kicking us $5 to get access to our premium feed, which of course involves all current and past episodes of Orbogorf and the Office Drones, our D&D &D real play podcast featuring actual office workers living in a fantasy setting. It is fun and stupid, and Todd has cryptocurrency powers now <laughs> for whatever reason. Great. Until next time, my name is Andrew Henderson. I am Kyle Grimoire Vice, Grimoire Vice, bless my homeland forever, Harper. <laughs> and I am Todd. No one's been like Gestalt's a kingpin like Gestalt. No one's got a swell cleft in his chin like Gestalt. As a specimen, yes, I'm intimidating. My, what a guy that Gestalt's Thomas. I saw you grinning like a fucking 
asshole 45 minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's about when so I that's about that. when I decided to do yeah. to do the time the about right as well. <laughs> And we're saying thanks for debating with us. And if you think we're wrong, you can come fight Todd behind the swing sets. <laughs> <laughs> I regret nothing. <laughs> Smiley,